Well, good, after, good afternoon and welcome to the City Planning Commission review session. I want to start by noting that this is a red letter day for the commission because we are once again back at our full complement. And I want to welcome David Burney, who needs no introduction, having served as DDC commissioner, so knows his way, I would suspect, around a ULERP or two, and who is currently a professor at Pratt. So. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, Ryan, I think we're ready to go. Okay. Uh, before we start our regular agenda, we're going to have a City Planning Commission special meeting uh, held in New York City Planning Commission hearing room, Lower Concourse 120 Broadway. Today is Monday, April 8th, 2019, and the time is 1 o'clock. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Bernie. Here. Commissioner Capelli. So confused. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Cirillo. Here. Commissioner De La Uz. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Knight. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marin. Here. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. Commissioner Rampashad. Here. A quorum is present. Let's turn to page one in the calendar. <coughs> Reports, Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers one and two, uh, CD8, calendar number one, C1800042, ZMK, calendar number two, N180043, ZRK. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 1010 Pacific Street rezoning for favorable reports on calendar numbers one and two. Chair Lago. Before casting my vote, I wanted to make comments that apply both to this application and the next application. Um, I wanted to reiterate what I said at the time of certification, which is that in order to be rational and consistent with sound land use policy, the rezoning boundaries for both of the applications need to <laughs> extend to Classen Avenue. Classen is a north-south corridor that connects the neighborhoods of Crown Heights and Bed-Stuy. Cutting out the sites that aren't owned by the applicants and that front on Classen Avenue would result in mid-block islands of R7 totally surrounded by an M1 district. And it would be disconnect these sites from the corridor, which is where residential development is especially appropriate. And with that, I vote yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Burney. I abstain. Commissioner Capelli. I vote no. Commissioner Cirillo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Um, I vote yes as amended, and I hope that the council uh, amends the MIH or clarifies the MIH is just option one. Um, and I'll wait to the next one to say something else. <laughs> Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampashad? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers one and two. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers three and four, CD8, calendar number three, C160175, ZMK, calendar number four, N160176, ZRK. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 1050 Pacific Street rezoning, for favorable reports on calendar numbers three and four, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Burney? I abstain. Commissioner Capelli? No. Commissioner Cirillo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Um, yes, again, I'm hoping that the MIH option uh, gets changed at the council level, and I um, really hope that uh, the department will move forward with M Crown so that um, we can have a consistent approach uh, to redevelopment in the community. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Uh, similar enthusiasm for moving forward with the M Crown uh, rezoning. Um, I vote yes here. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Commissioner Rampashad? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers three and four. 
Seeing as there is no other business before the commission, uh, this concludes the special commission meeting of Monday, April 8th, 2019. The time is 1.04 p.m. Before we re begin our regular agenda for a review session, uh, we have a presentation by Carol Samuel and Michael Parkinson of the Bronx, Bronx office with an update on the Jerome Avenue neighborhood plan. It is indeed uh, very exciting to be here to provide an update uh, on the Jerome Avenue Neighborhood Plan. It's a year out. Um, I'm thinking of this as a moment of reflection, um, you know, thinking back on what the process was, but also sharing with you the significant progress that we've made um, in this very uh, short time. I'm, I will be joined uh, with by Michael Parkinson. He's the senior neighbor, uh, senior planner, neighborhood planning manager in the Bronx office. Michael Sandler, the HPD director of neighborhood strategies, and uh, Janet Paguero from Small Business Services. She's the Jerome Avenue program manager um, on the ground every day, serving businesses um, and workers uh, along the Jerome Avenue corridor. Um, I thought I would first kind of go over, for some of you who are new, a little bit of, of the Jerome Avenue geography that we're referring to. Um, so this is a two-mile stretch of Jerome Avenue, uh, running from the Bronx Civic Center in the south to Fordham Road, basically in the north. Um, it is uh, well served by transit with the four, and then they're very close by along the Grand Concourse, the D. About 300, more than 320,000 people live here. Um, in this general area, the size of the city of Pittsburgh. I think that's a good reminder for ourselves. Um, the area is bisected by um, the Cross Bronx as well. Um, other, other populations of interest, you know, the largest uh, African population in the city, I would therefore say in the country, just speculating. Um, major institutions around, around, including the Bronx Community College, um, the Bronx Museum of Arts, and of course the Civic Center. Um, so this is the area that we're talking about when we talk about Jerome Avenue. And you know, the Jerome Avenue Neighborhood Plan really provides a blueprint um, altogether for thoughtful growth uh, in housing, but also investments in the neighborhood and in people. And I wanted to kind of take a moment to just reflect back on the process and um, what it was for us. Um, and just a reminder that it was not easy in the beginning. When we started, um, we, we were invited to come and do the study by the community board, but you know, others really strongly disagreed with us. And uh, we were you know, confronted on the street um, and, and when we were doing tours. Uh, we had a working group of local uh, organizations that we s established to guide our process, that was disrupted and we were not allowed to continue with that because people were concerned about transparency. Um, and we were really just intending that group to be a guide for us. Um, so we had to find other ways to get that guide. Um, and we, it just meant we were, had to work harder, which we absolutely did um, and didn't have this group to continue. Um, it's unfortunate because I think that was a real opportunity to have one conversation and for us to learn across, across organizations. Um, Council member Vanessa Gibson at the start um, was skeptical. And she was, the jury was out for her. What's, what's this going to be like? What's this process providing to us? Why do I have to have this process to get investment in the community here? And um, by the end, she was one of the, the strongest supporters of the process because she really saw it. Um, this really made us think on our feet throughout um, the process and we were able to be flexible. Every planning process needs to be flexible. Every planning process needs to be responsive to the local community and the, the needs of communication throughout. Um, and, and we were able to do that. And I'll give just two examples of the ways that we, we did that. You know, we or three examples. We, had, we were out in summer events. Um, every summer, whether it was 106 degrees or a beautiful sunny day on the Grand Concourse, we were out there on the Grand Concourse, Davidson Avenue, DeVoe Park, talking to people who would not come to an open house, who would not spend time to, you know, you know, protest or, or join in, in any other kind of conversation. Um, that just the regular people in the Bronx 
learning what their priorities were. We had a very specific exercise to understand what was most important to them. Um, we had a special session on scoping. Um, as you all, I know, fully respect, uh, the environmental review process was quite vexing to uh, a lot of people. There was a lot of mystery around it. And we had to create a special session. We saw a need for a special session to describe what it was and what did scoping mean specifically to Jerome? And what, what, what were we doing? What was it and what was it not? Um, what would it give us? Um, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of that work. Michael Parkinson was instrumental in creating it. It's a training session that we've since taken to community boards and others. Um, Michael deserves a lot of credit for that. Really breaking down scoping into very human terms and understandable terms. It, it earned us a lot of goodwill. It did not earn us a more orderly scoping session, <laughs> um, I will say that. But it really, I think, it communicated to leaders in the community, uh, they were more educated, they were more informed, and I think that was worth every, every bit of that. Um, we recognized that we needed to have a special session around the Cross Bronx Expressway where the two community boards, four and five, come together um, because it bisects the entire corridor. It's the most complicated section of the entire corridor. If you've ever been there, you understand. You've, if you've ever gotten on the, off the Jerome Avenue exit, you have driven there. If you've ever walked down Jerome Avenue, um, you, you have been there and, and understand the complexities. Um, and really, we, we thought about, together with the community, well, what needs to be done today to make it safer because it's not safe? And then what needs to be done? What's the vision in the future for the parks and the open spaces that are around it to make this a place? And that brings me to the plan, which you know is also in contrast with the commitments that were made throughout the process um, uh, you know, for the council members. Um, you know, there is a difference. The, the plan is quite broad. It is long term. It's intended to be that way. Not everything in the plan received commitments. Um, and there were choices. And there were, this was a, an opportunity in a way, and I, I will say this um, to, you know, to you all, but also I say this to the, to the other council members and the other community boards. This was a way for them to enact their vision throughout. Um, there were choices that they had. I'll give you two examples. Uh, Council Member Cabrera, there was a park on Davidson Avenue. It used to be a park, but it had collapsed. We had assessed that it would be very expensive to rebuild as a park. And we decided to, you know, that we, it was our recommendation that it not be made a park. But the, the community board and the local people and the council member ultimately decided they wanted it to be a park again. And that was where we put our commitments uh, and funding uh, to create a park there um, in the middle of, of, a, of a dense street. Another choice um, and another opportunity for a council member to enact the vision was um, you know, we, it was with Council Member Gibson. You know, when we enter these processes, we're always, um, you know, very attuned to what's happening on the street, what's happening with properties. Property owners approach us. You know, it's 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 a conversation, but we're very aware of what's being proposed. And we saw a site on Edward L. Grant Highway, that very significant site, very important location, was being demolished. So we went and looked. Well, what's what's being proposed here? It was self storage. Self storage. So we quickly communicated with the council member and said, This is what's being proposed. We learned who the developers were. She brought them in. You know, this is, they were fully, they were ready to go forward with self storage. That was their business model. And she said, You know, I would like to see housing. I would like to see a school. This is a really important location. They met with uh, Housing Preservation and Development. They met with the School Construction Authority. And do you know, through this process, that's going to be a school. It's not going to be self-storage. And I would say to you that without this process, I don't know that we would have been able to have the stars aligned to intervene in such a way to serve the community in a, in a better way. Um, so I think those are two ways that, that council members are able to enact their vision and, and influence the, the parties that are involved. And finally, you know, local organizations, community-based organizations. The city does not do this alone. You will hear this throughout the update. Um, and I would point back to the Jerome Coalition, you know, one of our strongest opponents. But I, in my opinion, opponent is, is not quite the right word because really we're pushing all in the same direction. And they, it was a matter of degrees. They wanted us to go over here and we could go here because we've got to think about you know, a, a much larger pool to, to uh, serve. Um, 
but they were able to enact their platform, which is absolutely critical to the success of Jerome Avenue and the service to the Bronx and the most vulnerable populations, whether that is getting legal representation in housing court or the certificate of no harassment or any kind of anti-harassment uh, work. So, you know, we, as a planning process, provided them with a great foil um, that allowed them to express and get a lot done. And our process was absolutely enhanced with that because they were enacting things that were citywide. Um, that's one example. You, you will see, as in the update, community-based organizations and partnerships with them in the implementation of any planning process. Absolutely, the threads run through everything, whether it is housing, we have task force on housing, um, jobs and workforce development, labor and health. Uh, all these are engaging with CBOs. Many of the uh, agencies actually really count on CBOs to, to bring forth their mission, whether it's serving small businesses or you know, building housing. You know, HPD does not build housing. It requires others to do that, a lot of them local CBOs. So anyway, I, that's my reflection, my personal reflection and professional reflection just a year out. I'm, I'm curious what I will think about all of this in five years and what we will all think about this in five years. Um, but you, I think you'll see that we're making a lot of progress, positive progress um, in, in the, the planning implementation. Um, the goals of the plan were, of course, to provide new opportunities for affordable housing, uh, but also, more importantly, preserve and invest existing affordable housing. You know, some of the densest neighborhoods in New York City are in these areas. Uh, lots of opportunities with, with, to preserve affordable housing. With the investment that the city made during the process in pres preservation of affordable housing and the commitments that we made at the end of the process for the actual implementation of capital and capital needs. It's a billion dollars of investment in these neighborhoods that this planning process brought to these neighborhoods. I'm very proud of that. Um, you know, the other aspect of it, and this is the real push-pull of Jerome Avenue, you know, creating opportunities for diverse retail and commercial opportunities at the same time that we're supporting local economy and local workers. That was the very push-pull. How do we make Jerome Avenue work for the local community, but also protect the, the businesses that are there today? Um, because Jerome Avenue doesn't work today for the local community, but there are people who work and live there. Um, and underpinning all of this was the improvement of quality of life and health. That's everything. Making Jerome safe, walkable, attractive with the elevated train above. Making sure our parks and our schools were adequate and invested in and su supporting our other community institutions. These are broad goals um, and, and you'll see how we've attempted to uh, address them. The planning process itself was very diverse. As I said, we had to think on our feet and be very flexible, whether it was summer programs, uh, visioning sessions, open houses. We had more than 40 events we were, where we were out in the public talking to people, getting feedback. Um, the pillars of the plan um, ha have remained um, zoning and land uses, but one of them, I think it is the, the biggest boogeyman of them all, uh, because it really, people are afraid the most of zoning. And I think we're gonna try and sh share with you as, as the body that approves the actual zoning changes, some of the, um, what has happened with the zoning, the new zoning that was implemented. But there are also other, many other housing and jobs and businesses um, and access and mobility circulation, community resources that, that you have been, we've made significant progress on as well that you should find of interest. The planning process, you know, we, transparency was a really important part of it, um, and we documented after every step, and you can see the thread of conversation from the first open house to the final draft plan to the final final plan of how the conversation built and grew and um, uh, you know really reflected uh, what the community was saying to us. And left us with this final plan, which you have in front of you. Um, this is but a summary of the final plan. Um, it's something that we think is, is helpful to uh, kind of document um, you know, what, we'll, what we'll be doing going forward. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael Parkinson, who will provide um, even more in detail about what's happened in the past year. Michael? Great. Thank you, Carol, for that, that history and context. I think that that's 
uh, a reflection worth making, especially you know a, a year out from the adoption of the land use components. Um, and, and I'm sure throughout my portion of the presentation, I'll echo some of the points Carol had made. Um, I, I think many of her points are worth underscoring, um, not the least of which is the idea that the, the zoning and land use components of our plan was not the plan itself, and, and in fact, a rather a, a component of a broader plan. Uh, but given that the commission did vote on the actions, uh, I, I wanted to, to make sure to reiterate and spend a little bit of time on that zoning piece, especially as it relates to subsequent development and some of the things that we've seen in the wake of the zoning. Um, so if you all recall, uh, this plan was certified, or the, or the land use component of the plan, um, in August of 2017, and ultimately voted out at the city council um, last March, so March of 2018. Um, and all along the way, at all three community boards, at the borough president, at the planning commission, uh, the, the plan and the land use components did receive affirmative votes, albeit with conditions along the way. I, I think at every step, the community and the borough president and everybody realized that this was a great opportunity, but there, there needed to be some assurances as well. And, and, and I think that the commitments that were made as part of this plan, or as part of this process, really speak to those assurances that were required. Um, and I should also, you know, mention Mention that while I'll be talking um, specifically about some of the commitments that were made and codified into law through this process, this is not an official update. So every June per local law, the city will be um, issuing updates on all of the commitments. But what I wanted to report back on today were, were those commitments that were most pertinent to the plan and the process and most relevant to the commission. Um, but I'll start with the zoning framework because that's really what got us here. Um, and and uh, to remind the commission, in these dense neighborhoods along the, the 4 train and the BD train in the Southwest Bronx, we had a few land use goals that we were trying to accomplish through the zoning and mapping of, of new residential districts where um, former C8 and M1 districts existed. And, and the sort of the framework that allowed those to, to play out was, was the promotion of development at stations, specifically the 4 train stations, um, creating nodes of density where we had opportunities at wide streets, uh, where development sites in certain areas uh, allowed them uh, to, to fully develop, specifically in the southern portion of the, uh, of the area. Uh, promoting opportunities for development along major corridors. So whether or not that was Burnside Avenue in the northern portion, uh, Edward L. Grant Highway or 170th Street to the southern, making sure those major corridors were, were really being um, addressed as such. Um, expanding commercial uses along the Burnside and Tremont corridors in the north, um, allowing sort of a broader set of use groups to include entertainment uses and some, some office uses, where we really think that those things will be appropriate in the coming years, um, not only in the, in the near term, but, but in the long term. Uh, and then promoting mid-density development and retail continuity throughout the corridor itself. As we've mentioned, this is an elevated rail corridor. It is often um, a, a very difficult landscape to sort of traverse, not only um, because of the streetscape, but also because of the land uses and, and, and making sure that as the corridor develops over time, it is promoting this continuity, this spine that's connecting the neighborhoods, uh, as opposed to what we had heard and learned through the process, um, as th that, that the corridor can currently serve as a divider. Um, and then, of course, maintaining existing zoning where we felt it was appropriate. So really going into this process with clear eyes, understanding this is not going to be a wholesale change of the neighborhood or change of the character, uh, but really being uh, um, deliberate and thoughtful about where we were proposing rezoning and where we were not. Uh, and then throughout the entirety of the rezoning area, mapping special rules via the Jerome Avenue Special District that did things like respond to some particularly challenging site conditions where you had um, acute angles or pinched lots, uh, or as, as lots fronted the elevated rail, making sure that our zoning rules provided the flexibility to allow development to occur over time uh, in a thoughtful way, uh, in a way that was responsive to those um, local constraints. And then throughout um, the entirety of the study area where we were upzoning uh, to provide provide more opportunities for residential development, mapping mandatory inclusionary housing. So with that, I'll sort of shift to some of the goals and updates on the housing, uh, as far as the housing landscape is concerned. But I wanted to start with a reminder of what, what our goals really were here. And, and they were fairly simple, um, right? They were to provide opportunities for affordable housing, sustainable and high quality affordable housing that served a, a range of income levels, as well as protect tenants and improve housing quality. Really just two goals, but I think, I mean, we could take an entire, well, years of meetings probably to really flesh out what exactly these things mean. Um, but we really think that we, we've uh, made a lot of strides working with our partners, working closely with the uh, Department of Housing Preservation and Development to start to achieve some of these goals through some very specific implementation measures. Uh, so for instance, 
you know, where we set out to provide opportunities for new construction of affordable housing through zoning actions, we also wanted to be cognizant that these are rich affordable housing neighborhoods to begin with, with the stock that is existing today, and making sure that that stock is preserved, protected, and invested in was paramount um, to the housing component of this plan. So uh, HBD, a year out, um, continues to offer loans and in, uh, uh, tax incentives to make sure that those programs are being utilized, being re-upped. Um, and so far to date, just since the passage of the zoning uh, in March of 18, 2018, uh, over 750 units of housing have been preserved in community boards four and five in the Bronx, uh, which is a pretty remarkable number for just a one year span. But I'd remind the commission that that comes on top of an additional 5,500 units of housing in the same geography that was, um, that was preserved since the start of the planning process in 2014. So really, I mean, that in and of itself represents the foundation of the housing plan uh, as it relates to the Jerome Avenue neighborhood plan. Uh, HBD continues to host outreach and marketing events. They're piloting a landlord ambassadors program up in the Bronx, which uh, was a two-year pilot um, that is gonna run through this summer, uh, but is potentially potentially will be expanded citywide. Uh, and there were three sets of local properties that were included in this program. Um, additionally, HBD also is continuing to help homeowners by providing resources for the smaller homes, for homes that are between one and four families. So not just focusing on the large apartment building, but also recognizing that in these in these neighborhoods, specifically High Bridge and University Heights, there are, are a number of smaller homes and, the, and uh, property owners do need access to these resources and the information about these resources. Uh, and then finally, the implementation of the Neighborhood Pillar Programs last December offers a wonderful opportunity, a new opportunity uh, for local CBOs and nonprofits to actually um, utilize tax exemptions, low interest loans, and other down payment assistance uh, um, and things like that to actually purchase properties, be them rent stabilized or with no affordability agreements at all to get them into def affordability programs, which are so, excuse me, so important. Uh, and then, of course, Jerome area was added to one of three pilot areas in the city as part of the um, Partners in Preservation Initiative. And two local um, groups, both CASA, which is Community Action for Safe Apartments, uh, and the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition have been awarded grants to, to um, uh, be the, the sort of uh, um, community stewards of this uh, um, partners in preservation work, really aimed at tenant protection and anti-displacement um, strategies. Uh, and and that, those were funded roles, right? So, so each of those groups received money to be doing this work. Um, as far as the new construction land, landscape is con uh, concerned, um, the city will continue to offer um, uh, tax and low income loan uh, opportunities for new construction. Um, already in this area, over 230 apartments have been uh, um have been financed, but that that's also uh, in addition to a number of others that are in the pipeline, uh, which some of which I'll share details about. Um, and where the city had resources in public land, really making sure that, that we were doing everything we could to advance affordable housing goals on those sites. Um, so the, the two main sites, while we didn't have a lot of city property to work with, we did have a few strategic locations. Uh, the images here show on top the 97 West 169th Street, uh, which is also uh, part of the Corporal Fisher um, land use action, which was a demapping of the street, if you recall. Uh, and then on the bottom there, uh, the Morrisania Diagnostic Treatment Center, which is a large surface lot, really uh, right on River Avenue at the elevated rail as it converges with Jerome Avenue. So a very strategic location to advance affordable housing goals on those sites. Um, I'll pause here for a second. I'm going to go through each of these numbers in the subsequent slides to show you the types of proposals we're seeing that have been facilitated by the rezoning. But before I do that, I also wanted to make sure to call out the, the red dots on the map. So again, I, I mean, a, a point that has been made but I think deserves underscoring again is how important preservation is in the work that HPD is doing and the work that the city is doing here. Um, and so all of those red, red properties on the map represent a, uh, units that have been um, units and buildings that have been uh, um, invested in and re-upped affordability agreements with HPD in the last year alone. Um, and if you sort of expanded this map backwards and look back into 2016, 2015, 2014, you would see these properties shifted around. And I only say that because there's a concentration right here uh, in sort of the northern and northeast portion of the study area. But expanding back in, in, in our draft plan from last October, we actually have a map that does go a little further back. I should have included 
here, but there, there is a smattering and, and distribution of these preservation properties all throughout the community districts here. Uh, and again, such important um, preservation work. Um, so as we sort of go through these projects of new construction, I'll also note that these programs are subject to change. The, these are folks that are in uh, um, conversations with the city right now, with the state right now, uh, but some of these properties have pulled um, uh, permits and we really expect these, these projects to be moving forward uh, in short order. Uh, so the first one I'd highlight here is 1159 River Avenue, uh, which represents a mix of supportive and affordable housing um, with an allocation of, of um, formerly homeless family set aside. Um, so folks that are transitioning out of the shelter system into permanent housing uh, may very well find a home here at 1159 River Avenue. Uh, and these are being developed by Community Access, uh, a nonprofit in the city who has a long track record of, of um, producing this type of housing. Just across the street at 1164 and 1184 Jerome Avenue is a proposal that'll call for another 500 units of affordable housing at a ra range of uh, AMIs and, and income eligibility. Again, just sort of demonstrating the kind of momentum that we're seeing in the wake of these actions. Uh, 1331 Jerome Avenue, just a little further north on the corridor. Again, a mix of supportive units targeted at the very low incomes that the community um, um, had, had let us know throughout the process we're very interested in seeing, but also a mix of, of other affordable units uh, in this project as well. Um, finally, moving further north still, 160 units of affordable housing at Davidson Avenue, um, or, or excuse me, the Davidson Step Street and 29 Feather Bed Lane. Uh, and this is a proposal that is in conversations with, with HPD right now that's gonna ultimately produce about 160 units of affordable housing uh, at a slightly different range of, of AMIs, again, showing that there are there is a broad and diverse range of, of incomes being supported through the, the types of developments we've been seeing this far. Um, and then here, just west of that, um, Star Hill, which is a, the, the old Cavalry Hospital site, um, which is poised to deliver between 350 and 500 units of uh, income-restricted affordable housing and supportive housing. Uh, and in addition to that, the program calls for publicly accessible green space, a publicly facing medical clinic, uh, as well as a community use, um, be it a community center or some type of educational use. And then finally, um, 1776 Jerome Avenue, which will be a 17-story um, affordable, mixed affordable supportive project uh, at 176th and Jerome Avenue, right on the corridor. Uh, in fact, just within eyesight of, of my desk at the Bronx office in uh, um, city planning. So I can, I can monitor the progress from my desk. I can keep you all posted as that goes. Uh, but again, a, a really prominent, important site right at a number four train stop and immediately adjacent to one of the... Uh, unique assets of the step streets of, of um, the Southwest Bronx. So in addition to the preservation work and the new construction work, of course, the promotion of safe and healthy housing and tenant protection are also bedrocks of this plan. Um, and just in the last year alone, HPD has been hard at work uh, doing inspections, really flagging programs for emergency, or excuse me, uh, flagging properties that are in need of emergency repair, potentially uh, um, litigation, also uh, including new properties in different uh, um, enforcement programs, whether or not it's the underlying conditions program or the alternative enforcement programs, really using all of their tools to make sure that, that um, the tenants of the Southwest Bronx are being uh, housed in, in health and in safe housing and in making sure that landlords are being accountable to that. Um, the, the plan also called for the creation of the Southwest Bronx Housing Task Force, uh, which is really an opportunity for HPD to explore their, their partners in preservation work uh, in coordination with local elected officials and the community as well. Uh, and then finally, the continuation of the robust legal representation through, through the right to counsel. Um, just in this last year alone, 11,000 um, Bronx tenants had, had been assisted through this program in, in the council, local council districts here. Um, and in addition to that, HPD has been busy sort of pounding the pavement and, and door knocking. And, and they've visited over 27,000 um, tenants to make sure that everybody in, in the area knows of all these services and programs that are rightfully available to them. Um, in addition to that, they've been hosting tenant resource fairs. I know they've hosted the homeowner resource fairs. Again, sort of just, just keeping in line with the idea that all of the services and programs in the world don't mean much if people don't know about these programs. So I'm really happy to say that our sister agencies, not only HPD, but you'll also learn more about what SBS is doing, but our sister agencies are making sure that they're doing what they can to market their products and make sure that people are aware. 
Uh, and then finally, um, the establishment of the certification of no harassment in community boards four and five, ensuring that any significant work, um, be it um, um, alterations or new construction on identified buildings in Br uh, Bronx Community Board four and Bronx Community Board five are receiving a certification of no harassment from uh, HBD prior to, to getting those um, permits. Uh, so moving on to the economic and workforce development components of the plan, this was also, as, as you know, um, a really important um, part of our process and our plan to make sure that residents and workers, as well as small business owners, uh, um, had uh, an opportunity to grow, to expand, to be protected in their pursuit of working and operating businesses. So the goals here, again, fairly straightforward, but important, right? Creating retail diversity, making sure that work had opportunities for, for career training and job training in a variety of fields, um, supporting of the auto-related businesses that are so prevalent along the corridor, uh, and the promotion of small businesses and entrepreneurship throughout. Um, and, and we're already well on our way to implementing a lot of measures that, that achieve these goals. Um, so first and foremost was the creation of the drone program manager. So this is a new staff line, a brand new position at SBS that puts somebody on the corridor on, on a daily and weekly basis, making sure that, that not only the businesses, but the workers uh, and residents of the area know exactly what's going on. They know exactly who they can talk to for resources, and they know exactly who, um, who they need to flag any issues of, be it um, harassment or, or lease negotiation, they know who to go to. Um, and, and we're joined here by Ch Janet Poguero, who is that uh, Jerome program manager. So as far as demonstrating implementation, no better way than, than bringing the, the commitment to the, the commission. Uh, and she'll be happy to elaborate or answer any questions on any of these items as we move on. Um, in addition to that, we're designing and developing uh, workforce training. SBS is hard at work um, working with community partners uh, on assessing training needs, and I believe they'll, they'll have over $300,000 of total contracts that they're going to be awarding uh, to a variety of, of, of um, or potentially for, to a variety of training avenues. So not necessarily only in the auto sector, but in a variety of, of budding sectors and in-demand in sectors in the Southwest Bronx. Um, the launching of the Auto Business Compliance and Retention Initiative, this is something that we will rely um, on our partners at the state, at the Department of Environmental Conservation, to help us implement. Um, and really, this is a, a program um, that has a proven track record called Operation Eco-Quality, and we were really interested in helping Operation Eco-Quality understand the opportunity of implementing their program along Jerome Avenue. So we're happy to say that DEC continues to uh, be a very uh, proactive partner with us. They're very interested in seeing what they can do along Jerome Avenue. And we're very interested in, in supporting them uh, as they do. Um, but in the, and those conversations are certainly ongoing uh, as they've just finished up um, a, a previous round of work in Canarsie. Um, so conducting workforce outreach and recruitment events, as well as connecting Jerome corridors uh, to training programs, and, and I'll actually just skip ahead one here too, uh, because both of those things are, are also related to the next item, which is deploying the SPS mobile unit. So whether or not it's, it's Janet uh, making herself available through weekly office hours at the council members' offices in the Bronx, whether or not it's the monthly visit of the, the mobile unit, the SPS mobile unit on site, or if it's just one-off um, uh, individual individual uh, um, uh, events and different types of presentations that SBS is doing, they are really making sure to be front and center of these conversations in the Southwest Bronx, uh, bringing all their resources to bear, uh, including things like um, opportunities for workforce training, job placement, access to capital, which is a big one, um, and a variety in, in lease negotiations, among other items. Um, th there was also the creation of the Jerome Avenue Business Grant Program. Uh, this is The language of this is currently being finalized as we speak, but this is a relocation assistance for any um, heavy commercial use uh, that is displaced um, via new development coming, coming to the corridor. So this will be grants up to $20,000 made available to any businesses that relocate um, because of a development happening along the corridor. Um, and, and those will all be, those are all designed to be retro Active. Uh, and so I, I would mention that while it's not 
off the ground immediately. Any business, which we've seen very few, I'll also, I should have mentioned earlier when we were looking at one of the development sites, 1331 Jerome Avenue, there's only been one development site thus far uh, that has had any type of active business on it. Um, and, and that includes one owner occupied business as, as well as a few smaller pieces of the property that they were subletting. Uh, but all of those businesses, the, the auto businesses that were on site will have access to these relocation grants when they're off the ground and, and operational. Uh, and then again, I'll, I'll just reiterate the, the working with uh, businesses along the corridor to make sure that they are connected to access uh, to sources of capital, which include uh, over 40 lenders in the city and, and micro lenders and things like that, um, that may be non-traditional, may not always um, be front and you know, top of mind for some of these businesses. SBS is really doing the work to make sure that those connections are being made. Uh, and then now I'll just sort of finally shift gears to kind of the public realm in, in what we call streets and transportation, parks and community resources. So when you're really on the ground in Jerome Avenue and you really see the public space uh, and the investments coming to it, um, th that all that information is really captured in this next section. Uh, and, and again, like the previous sections, the goals here, Fairly straightforward, but but very important. Um, you know, improve quality of life and health of, of uh, neighborhood residents. Promote a safe and walkable Jerome Avenue underneath the elevated rail. Uh, meet the educational and service needs of the community. Things like that. Um, and, and all of these things, I'd say, we're well on our way to achieving through a lot of the programs and capital investments coming to the corridor. Uh, so starting with streets and transportation, I'll just sort of walk you through these quickly. Um, as Carol mentioned, and I'll spend another minute on it in a second here, but making improvements to the intersection at the Cross Bronx uh, Exchange with Jerome Avenue, um, the reconstruction of both Clifford Place Step Street and Davidson Step Street, the implementation of a comprehensive streetscape and pedestrian improvements underneath the elevated rail along Jerome Avenue, uh, and, and last but certainly not least, supporting the MTA uh, in their accessibility project at one. 70th Street. So as, as transit rich as the Jerome Avenue corridor is, it's only it's only as transit rich as it is accessible. And between um, Yankee Stadium, 161st Street, and Fordham Road to the north, there were no elevators along the four train line. That will soon change um, at 170th Street. So we're just making sure that, that our resources and, and um, partners at DOT are closely coordinating with the MTA uh, to make sure that both projects uh, um, are, are sort of being facilitated simultaneously and not, not causing any issues uh, amongst the coordination. Um, and then finally, or excuse me, I, I'll start by, by reiterating how important this interchange is. And, and Carol had mentioned it earlier as, as sort of something that stuck out to us during our process that deserved more attention um, than other areas. And, and it was this interchange of the Cross Bronx Expressway and Jerome Avenue. Um, and, and just to echo Carol, anyone who's walked the length of Jerome Avenue and had to cross the Cross Bronx knows it, it is inhospitable. It, it is downright dangerous. And, and not only is that, uh, you know, perceived intuitively, that, that bears out in the data and the Vision the vision Zero data that we had, we'd understood from DOT. Um, and, and it was clear that the changes needed to be made here. Um, and so DOT has gone in and already implemented and constructed this project, which includes things like new high visibility crosswalks, new pedestrian signals where none existed before, which, which again, when you're navigating the on-ramps and off-ramps of, of a highway uh, can be incredibly problematic. So now that there, there are new pedestrian signals where there were none, uh, there are new island, uh, pedestrian island and, and, and bump outs where pedestrians can actually wait. If you're pushing a stroller, if you're pushing a wheelchair, or if you, you know, if you just take a little bit longer crossing the street, you now have somewhere that is safe to rest, uh, that, that is accessible through ramps where there were none before, and don't require that you walk out into the middle of the street to navigate this stretch of the corridor. So it's it's wildly important. Um, I, th I think that we'll see in the coming years that this will do this will go a long way um, to improving the safety of res neighborhood residents, uh, including school children who travel um, routinely from the north of the Cross Bronx Expressway to some of the schools that are just south of it. Um, and, and I would also just point out on this slide that this is representative of a project um, that while was, was definitely a part of the planning process, did, was implemented before the rezoning actually took place. So, you know, oftentimes I, I think these conversations are, are um, you know, really, they, they come down to a quid pro quo argument, and, and they're just not that. This is one of many projects that we saw in it being invested in, in the community throughout the length of the process, uh, and I think that that's just worth noting. Um, moving on, 
Uh, I'll, I'll start with the bottom here, the reconstruction of Clifford Place Step Street and Davidson Step Street. Both of these are, are phenomenal neighborhood assets, important connections uh, between the Grand Concourse down to the Jerome Avenue corridor from the Morris Heights uh, neighborhood down to the, the um, Jerome Avenue corridor. When you're talking about getting people to the four train or getting people up to the B and D train or just people moving about their, their daily lives in their neighborhood, these are really necessary and unique assets in the Bronx. Uh, and, and DOT is committed to um, reconstructing both of these, um, one of which the Clifford Place Step Street is well underway and, and almost open. Uh, again, it's you know half a block south of our office, so something that we'll, we'll get great use out of. Um, and then the, the first point here, which is among the most important, in my opinion, as far as the streets are concerned, is this total transformation of Jerome Avenue as a, as a dangerous, inhospitable, noisy, harsh landscape today to a, a pedestrian-oriented, safe, walkable streetscape tomorrow. Um, DOT has committed to not only picking three strategic intersections at um, 170 Street, Burnside Avenue, and Tremont Avenue to really do some intense work at the at the inter intersection nodes, but also uh, making improvements throughout, some of which, again, have already been constructed and implemented irrespective of, of the um, rezoning components of the plan, which include things like um, bus bulb outs along Jerome Avenue underneath the elevated rail, which allow people quite simply um, to wait for a bus um, and not be in the middle of a service lane, but actually be in dedicated pedestrian space. Uh, again, supporting MTA on their accessibility project at 170th Street, just making sure that, that um, of course, the city and the state are coordinated and that the, the neighbors of um, the Southwest Bronx are really uh, um, will benefit from accessibility projects as well as streetscape projects alike, and neither of those things are going to preclude the other or get in the way of the other. Um, and then finally, advocating with, with MTA as we continue to do on their uh, bus redesign. We're expecting that they... they um, produce and, and uh, publish a draft plan in May. So we're excited to see what that will look like in terms of how the bus lines of the Southwest Bronx specifically are really gonna respond to some of the, the growth that we expect and some of the issues that were flagged throughout our process and theirs. Uh, moving on to schools. Um, schools was at the heart and soul of this planning process, um, really like, like they are so many others. Um, through this process, the city has committed to building a brand new school at 2355 Morris Avenue, which is um, number one on your map there. So that's a brand new school that where one did not exist before. Um, likewise, a, number two, they committed, the city committed um, to building a school in, in uh, school district nine. And I'll share a little more information in a second, but there, there was no site identified at the at, at the planning um, stage of this, but but one has since been identified, and there, that's going to be yet another brand new school coming to the Southwest Bronx. In addition to that, uh, the city is going to be building a standalone gymnasium and completing a P, uh, an annex on uh, Public School 33, which is well into design and is going to offer an additional 300-plus uh, school seats to the area. Um, so here, just going quickly left to right, are the locations in sort of timelines of these projects. So design is going to start this summer on the new school at 2355 Morris Avenue. Um, the bid is already underway, and, and we anticipate a September 2020 opening of the new um, standalone gymnasium at the Poe Center School, which is uh, Public School 246. Uh, and then a site has been identified and is currently um, under environmental review. And, and in fact, the commission would have received letters about the site selection of the school in, in the fall, and the, um, the SCA and DOE expect that the public hearings of the city council will be happening um, this month. And so that is, the, that is the site that Carol alluded to earlier, which was previously identified as uh, potentially a self-storage site. And through this process, conversations were, were able to be had and, and, and really, you know, visioning sessions and thinking critically about this site, what it meant to the community, what it meant to the developer, what it meant to the council member. Uh, and, and this site was identified and ultimately um, purchased for a brand new school along Edward L. Grant um, and 169th Street, which is, which is um, you know, I, I think just a nod to the planning process and the importance of having these conversations in that sort of realm. Uh, and then finally, the PS33 annex, you can see renderings here. Um, again, this is not an insignificant uh, annex expansion. This is this is going to be providing uh, much needed and, and um, really, really uh, um, anticipated school seats to the to uh, school district 10. Uh, and this is right along Jerome Avenue uh, itself. So the, you can see in the rendering on the left, that's the elevated, the dark gray is the elevated rail structure. So that will be sort of the, a, a prominent um, location as well, just, just north of the 184th Street um, station.
Uh, and then finally, I'll end with the open space commitments, which of course, anybody who's been to the Southwest Bronx understands how important parks and open space are. Um, and, and as important as streets and schools are, um, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who didn't prioritize parks in our process. Uh, and we've made a lot of, of, of um, strides into achieving, or excuse me, to implementing some of the um, projects that, that will achieve the goals that we set out for ourselves. So whether or not that's uh, activating and enhancing bridge playground, um, developing a new park that Carol spoke about earlier at 1801 Davidson Avenue, um, the development of Corporal Fisher Park, um, renovating and expanding Grant Avenue Park, improving access to Aqueduct Park, uh, the Aqueduct Walk sort of system of parks, uh, as well as in including the reconstruction of Morton Playground, um, increasing and improving access to the southern reaches of that system, and then um, renaming the park at West 181st Street. All of these things are happening. Um, they're all on track, they're all well underway, starting with Bridge Playground. This is um, well into design. Uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation have already held visioning sessions with the community. They've gone back and forth with, with different design iterations. Uh, and they expect construction on this playground in this park to begin uh, by June of this year. So right out of the gate, we're seeing immediate implementation of some of these things. Uh, again, moving quickly, just left to right, the development of a new park at 1801 Davidson Avenue. Uh, that's, the fur that's the image that's the furthest left, and I would point it out because Carol did mention that it is this sort of unique mid-block condition surrounded by apartment buildings and ha has been sitting derelict for, for many years uh, because of some of the geological issues um, and retaining wall issues of neighboring buildings. This park is going to get the much-needed investment um, that, that, it, that it really requires to become a neighborhood-serving local asset. Um, which it which it previously was and, and will be again. Uh, in the middle picture there, that's uh, Corporal Fisher Park, a, a longstanding vacant site in the South Bronx on 170th Street, which really kind of sits at the midpoint between the wonderful asset that is the High Bridge and the 170th Street connection. Um, this has been a vacant parcel sitting underutilized for many years. Through this process, we were able to demap property, a, a portion of, a, a, of an unbuilt street to add it to that parcel, and that will all be built out as a park. Um, and design is underway. They've already held multiple input meetings, envisioning meetings with the community. Uh, and then the renovation and expansion of Grant Park which I, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe this is what the Parks Chair of Community Board 4 has historically referred to as the park that wasn't. And this, this is a park that had, has a street running down the center of it that was demapped many, many years ago, but the, there were just not the assets in play that were able to um, really invest in it and, and build it out to its full potential. So you have two built out disparate portions of parkland uh, on either side of, of a, um, an unmapped but built out street bed that is gonna be reconnected in a really magnificent way and that's going to go a long way in serving not only the local community but in my estimation the surrounding neighborhoods as well as, as I would hesitate to call it a regional park but it's it's approaching that with the, the size and scale of it um, and then there, there's the improvement and um, increased access to aqueduct walk system, which is such a beloved and, and really great parks asset on the west side of the Jerome Avenue corridor that sits atop the old Croton Aqueduct, well, the, the existing Croton Aqueduct system, um, and between Tremont Avenue um, to the south and Kingsbridge Road to the north, there's public access throughout this entire thing, but there are just uh, portions of it are in need of repair, uh, in need of, of access that are currently cut off to public use. So through this process, we were able to make commitments to reconstruct portions of it, as well as make, make um, currently un inaccessible portions of it accessible moving forward. Um, and then finally, the renaming of a park at West 181st Street, which, which again, I'll also take a moment to sort of elaborate on, because this is also part of the aqueduct system, yet represents work that was ongoing, investment that was ongoing, irrespective of any zoning changes or, or, or um, planning efforts around it. And the Department of Park, or excuse me, the Department of Transportation built out a pretty sizable um, plaza space immediately adjacent to the aqueduct walk system, essentially serving as an expansion to aqueduct park. DPR is gonna come in and, and, and sort of instruct, uh, and construct rather, the green space of it, trees, lawn, sort of a, a nice central gathering space. And that space, it was renamed in December um, to honor a former Tuskegee Airman and previous Bronx Community College president, um, Roscoe Brown, in, in, in the, um, Pardon me, the, the name of the park is Captain Roscoe Brown PhD Plaza, rolls off the tongue. Um, 
And then finally, the reinvigoration of, of Green Thumb Community Gardens. There are a number of community gardens throughout the Southwest Bronx, but the process and the plan really helped us understand that not all of them were serving the, the, the public in the best ways. So the Green Thumb folks and the Borough Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez of the par Parks Department, really took it upon themselves to make sure uh, that these assets were being treated as such and were, were um, available to anybody who is interested in um, gardening or accessing these spaces. Uh, and, and just since in the last year, they have seen membership increased uh, and they've seen the, the spaces just respond better, be better organized, be better uh, cared for. So with that, uh, I just wanted to make sure to end on reminding the commission that, that in our minds, it was always the, the idea that the zoning and land use components that the commission voted on that, that were subject to the rezoning were only a portion of a broader plan. And I, I hope that some of our update today kind of helped contextualize that and make that clear. Um, but, you know, a, again, it's more than a sum of its parts. Uh, and, and we were really happy to provide this update to the commission because we, we felt like there's been a lot of great progress made even just a year out. So with that, thank you. And thank you to the commission for your patience. I know it was almost a full hour presentation, but we were just so pleased by what we saw on the ground and wanted to show how the very technical actions that come before us actually bear life. Commissioner Capelli. Uh, yes, not having been here for the beginning of the process, because this was done prior to my tenure, but being very familiar with this area from my years in the Bronx, uh, I couldn't be more pleased. I mean, this is just uh, wonderfully uh, 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 well uh, executed and comprehensive, and uh, you guys have done a really terrific job. So uh, I thank you for sharing uh, your progress with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Delos. I, I also appreciate the thorough overview of everything. Um, I'm just wondering, though, if it would be helpful perhaps as follow up, um, you know, the number of units that are outlined as having been proposed are really, really significant. I think having a sense of how many of those are um, in the for-profit sector versus the nonprofit sector would be helpful to understand because generally speaking, the nonprofits probably would have been preserved anyway, although not necessarily. And then it would also be helpful, I think, to understand what have we lost? Um, you know, how many how many units were have expired or opted out? How many have we lost because of luxury decontrol, which we'll see what happens in Albany? And then how many have been demolished? I mean, it's helpful to have the positive, but it's also helpful, I think, to understand what might be on the other side of that um, so that we can ensure that we can mitigate against those risks um, moving forward. And then um, I was especially interested um, on the, you know, Jerome Avenue program manager, welcome. Um, and I just, you know, it would be interesting to know how, how is success defined in that role? Um, I think that would be a helpful piece of information um, if, if you could share that. Um, Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think on, on the former, we'd be happy to, to gather that yeah, I see, information. I see folks back. from HPD writing notes in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And then, Janet, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about your role, how you measure success, uh, but I think it'd be enlightening to the commission. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for your question. Um, so initially, um, when I was onboarded, reading the points of agreements, working with DCP and the sister agencies, I was excited personally because I am a resident of the Bronx um, and understanding that these are difficult conversations to have with the community. Um, and so for me or for, for the agency, um, su success is education. So educating folks on the ground, not just about our services, mm -hmm. but how our services could impact the growth um, and the retainment of their businesses in the community, but also assuring that we were connecting residents that are in need of job opportunities or training opportunities to those services that we've developed throughout the years. Um, uh, additionally, su success for us um, is also defined by our partnerships on the ground. So working with different community-based organizations, local leaders, um, the council, council members, and um, working closely with the community board. But happy to expand upon that. Great, great. And you know, as someone who's uh, familiar with the workforce development field, um, and in particular, what unemployed and underemployed and workers that need to kind of transition need, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a component that also assesses 
um, where the skill level and the educational background of the workers are and what might be needed in order to move to the next job, because oftentimes what I have found is that it, um, it's those other jobs that exist, there's often the jobs, but it's the bridge to the job that really is where the, mi the missing link is. Correct, and the bridge is the most important um, uh, piece for us. We work with, I'll give you an example, Dominicanos USA, DUSA, the targets the foreign born population. Mm -hmm. So whenever we do have workforce events, we assure that we're partnering with an organization that's able to connect with different sectors. So um, we we learn on a monthly basis if we're target if we're targeting the um, out of school, out of work youth, um, how are they being receptive to our services and how are they connecting with us? Um, the other um, following month, we may be targeting targeting um, uh, the women in 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 the corridor. So we work with new. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's an organization for non traditional Not employment for women. Mm -hmm. Um, that offers uh, construction opportunities for women and other um, opportunities in that particular sector. So every month we're learning how, based on our, um, our workforce events, how folks are connecting to our services and our training programs. I just think part of, that's great, that's fantastic. It's also important, I think, that that those services are receiving the investments they need for, and as you identify people who are interested, sometimes if that interest goes unmatched with access right. to services and training, then it doesn't really help to even know that there's a bunch of jobs out there. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. For Bernie. Um, yeah, thank you for a terrific presentation. Clearly an enormous amount of work <laughs> went into this project. And just to actually follow up on that question, I mean, you clearly had a sort of theory of change when you started out on this project. And I wonder, is there a, a methodology for evaluating on a broad basis that change, measurements of success? It would be terrific to think that during this process, you could be sort of writing the lessons learned, the things that work, things that don't work for the next one that goes along. Um, it'd be interesting to see if that was possible. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think like any project of this scale, we'll, we'll still be learning lessons for years to come. Uh, and those are things, you know, for instance, on the development side that I think are, um, you know, the, the question of how we were defining success or what, what we were looking for when we, when we really um, initiated this project were set forth in our goals, right? It was the, the preservation of affordable housing in the community, which I think that uh, Commissioner De La Uz's question is, is a good one about, you know, what, what is the gain versus loss? But but ultimately, if, if our goal was to be preserving units, what is that looking like just on a quantitative level? On the on the new construction side, I think it could be a little bit trickier, um, but at least at this point, I, th I think we're, we're seeing what we assumed would happen, what we hoped would happen. Uh, when we talked about this project as being a facilitator of new construction for affordable housing, we're seeing that in the proposals coming through, in the types of program, uh, and, and, you know, for instance, the, the term sheets that are being selected, things like that, um, whether or not that, that, you know, that trend will continue in perpetuity, obviously, I think neighborhoods change, dynamics change, we'll see that, to, we'll see that start to change, um, but I think it's worth noting that, that of you know, of the sites that we're seeing development on, um, these are, you know, for all intents and purposes, some low-hanging fruit development sites, meaning these are really good, well-dimensioned, large development sites that if not for removing a significant barrier to development, i.e. ULERP and environmental review, we may see, we may have seen develop in very different ways in years to come. Um, and, and so I think that's one, one measure of success that we would look at is, is unlocking this, you know, uh, opportunity and seeing that opportunity being seized. Um, as far as uh, you know, some of the other lessons, I, I think, like I said, we'll, we'll continue to learn and document, and of course, reflect on as we move on. Other comments, Commissioner Levin. Well, and backing up way to the beginning, it seems to me, and Carol spoke of this a little bit. Um, one, another one of the lessons learned is the importance of persistence um, and being willing to listen to the local community. Um, as someone who is not super familiar with that neighborhood, I was, um, I think, honestly alarmed to read some of the press coming out of your early mm -hmm. efforts of engaging with the community. It sounded um, really pretty unpleasant and unproductive, um, but you kept at it, um, and you brought us uh, to the point of the ULERT process that certainly had some strong differences of opinion, but um, we got through ULERP into something that 
um, you know, was supported by the local community to a degree and the local council person. So it, in my view, particularly as, you know, I know the Charter Commission now is looking at earlier involvement by community boards in the pre-certification part of ULERP. Well, in fact, that's what happened here. Um, and that's what made this program successful. Um, so I really hope this becomes, you know, as, as these conversations get more and more difficult around the city, as our discussions about land use are increasingly polarized, um, this is a really important example of um, how the process can work effectively. And it's coupled with the city's willingness to bring significant resources to this project from the beginning. That was communicated throughout ULERP, and your follow-up here demonstrates that it's not disappearing. Um, so that sort of pattern of community engagement from before the beginning and after the end, um, I think is a very important message for other neighborhoods in the um, city to understand. Well, thank you for that observation. I, I would also note something I didn't I didn't spend a lot of time on in the presentation, but is worth noting are some of the task forces that have been set up through the process, notably um, the Jerome Avenue Public Health Task Force. And this was a commitment that the Department of Health made to really assessing health conditions and, and coming up with a health plan um, to follow uh, the neighborhood plan. And, and, and so what that represents, I think, is the, a continued implementation effort, but also mirrored with the, the continued participation and getting more voices around the table. So that's something that, that certainly is not lost post-certification, post-vote, post-implementation. That, that will be ongoing. Can I, Michael, I just wanted to add. Of course. I just wanted to add um, to, to your observation, uh, Commissioner. You know, there was a real debate here in the, uh, in, amongst the community. There was a debate. And amongst the community boards, amongst the public, amongst, uh, you know, everyone. And um, there was also a real opportunity for investment and um, and I feel like at the end of the day, we had the debate, we had a moment to air it. Um, it was in the end productive. Even our, our strongest opponents were really productive for the betterment of the entire city, I would say to you, um, and for the most vulnerable populations in the city. Um, and, and at the end of the day, we brought significant investments here. Um, and, and to stay the course, to really stay listening to the local communities, to take guidance, to be flexible, all of those things I think were so critical um, to, to our success here. Now that's a crucial message that's often missed. Yeah. Um, that communities can seriously shape these rezoning proposals by participating in the process. And they're not gonna get everything they want. And city planning isn't gonna get everything they want either. It's a, it's a give and it's a take by by both sides. That's right, um, that's right. And the council members still have opportunities throughout this process to influence and have their vision brought to, brought to light as well. It's, it's everyone has a, has a moment here. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, Carol, I just wanted to ask, I heard uh, early in the presentation about uh, this uh, auto uh, retention uh, initiative. Yes. And I just wanted to understand how that worked because I presume that uh, many, if not most, of the auto body businesses are tenants rather than owners. And I also assume that many of those are soft sites that might well be looked at as future housing sites. So how does that work together? Well, there were a couple aspects to the, to the retention policy. One was to leave some spaces zoned for, for auto-related uses and, and, and the like, right. and, and heavier commercial uses. Um, those were typically off the corridor, although in the north there were two, there were two spots around the Cross Bronx that we, we opted to leave. So that was one aspect of it. Then there's the grant program that SBS is working to create um, that is intended to support any business that wants to relocate, um, and um, my understanding the rules are still being um, crafted, um, and it would be, as Michael stated, retroactive, um, but, you know, helping them. You're, you're, you're really challenging my memory of the number of soft sites and things like that. I don't have that at the tip of my tongue um, that were, were had included auto-related businesses. It was quite a low number in, in the grand scheme of things, because quite frankly, um, the number of auto uses um, along the corridor are actually out, far outnumbered by the other kinds of uses that are there. It feels like it's all auto, 
but in reality, it was that was just a smaller number. Um, but we were very sensitive to them because they are a specific demographic. They are a specific, you know, training level, and education level um, that you know we want the business owners and the the workers alike. Um, so we were we were very sensitive to that. Any other comments? Then I will thank Carol and Michael, and actually not just the entire Bronx office, but the many other folks here at headquarters who supported yes. them throughout the process, and our sister agencies, many of whom are here in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is the review session of the New York City Planning Commission of Monday, April 8th, 2019. The time is 2.08 p.m. A quorum is present. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a city council modification scope determination. Uh, the city council proposes to modify uh, the text amendment uh, for the former Parkway Hospital rezoning, eliminating option two and the workforce option in the mandatory inclusionary housing program. Uh, this change is within scope. And so I'll ask for an assent by show of hands to let the council know it's in scope. Done. Okay. The second item on the agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Manhattan Community District 11. Our presenter is Joseph Hennikins. Okay, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, this is an application by the owners of the Terrence Cardinal Cook Healthcare Center uh, for a zoning map change and zoning text amendment for a site in Manhattan Community Board 11. The applicant is ArchCare, which is the Archdiocese of New York's uh, health services branch. And the facility is located on a full box site uh, bound by Fifth Avenue, East 106th Street, Madison Avenue, and East 105th Street. The applicant is seeking a zoning map change from R72 and R72C15 to R8 and R8 C15 for a portion of the zoning lot. And then they're also seeking a, a text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area uh, at the site. So Terrence Cardinal Cook, as it exists today, has about 600 uh, hospital bed or beds spread between a skilled nursing facility and a specialty hospital. They serve a high need population. 86% um, of the patients are in Medicaid and only 2% are in private insurance. And it's also the only remaining HIV AIDS nursing facility uh, in New York City. And most of the staff and, and many of the patients come from the, the wider surrounding area of East Harlem and, and Greater Harlem. Um, the campus includes four buildings, which you can see here. Uh, the Flower Hill Building on Central Park is uh, an architecturally significant 11-story uh, structure, and it's the oldest part of the hospital campus. The eight-story annex, which is next door, was added in the 1930s. The 10-story Cohen Building was added in the 1980s. And there's also a parking garage uh, on the southeast corner of the site, which is currently closed and unused. Uh, the TCC uh, site is split between two zoning districts. Um, within 150 feet of Fifth Avenue, it's zoned R9, and it's located in the Park Improvement District. And then the remainder of the site is R72 and R72C15. The surrounding area is primarily a residential and institutional. There's some neighborhood commercial uh, retail along the major corridors. An R9 district encompasses the full block north of the project area, and then there's additional R9 uh, north and south of the site along Central Park. The rest of the surrounding area is primarily R72, although there are two uh, C84 commercial districts about a block uh, to the east along Park Avenue. And then two blocks to the east is the new Special East Harlem Corridors District, which includes R7A, R7B, R7D, and R9 zoning in the surrounding area. Just some pictures for context. Uh, north of the site on that R9 district is a 24-story uh, Lakeview Towers, which is a Mitchell Llama building. South of the site are a handful of five to seven-story residential buildings and also El Museo del Barrio. Uh, east are two NYCHA developments, Carver Houses and Lehman Village, and then to the west is Central Park. Sort of zooming out, you can see that this diverse context extends beyond the immediate surroundings. Um, there's a mixture of mid-century tower-in-the-park style developments and then smaller pre-war residential buildings. 
a particularly noteworthy building um, that you can see sort of peeking out uh, at this, the bottom of the page is the new residential tower built by Mount Sinai Hospital at 101st Street. Uh, that is a sort of an analogous project to the proposal here. You can also see the Metro North Viaduct, which divides this section of, the, of East Harlem from the, the rest of East Harlem. And you can see the sixth train, which is the closest transit. Uh, there's stations at 103rd and 110th Street. There's also buses along Fifth Avenue and, North, and Madison. So in recent years, uh, two challenges have existed, have emerged for TCC. Um, first, the facility has aged and the physical plant has deteriorated significantly. And second, state and federal policy uh, increasingly emphasizes home-based residential care. So in response to these twin challenges, uh, Arch Care feels it's imperative to rebalance operations in a modernized Flower Hill building and to construct a more residential facility for some of the long-term patients. Uh, this modernization is anticipated to cost at least $100 million and to fund the repairs, ArchCare is proposing to partner with a private developer to construct a residential tower on a portion of the site. So to facilitate that redevelopment, the applicant is seeking to rezone the R72 and R72 C15 portion of the larger zoning lot to R8 and R8 C15. R8 would be a step down from the R9, uh, between the R9 and the R72, and it's representative of the existing built context of the surrounding area. The portion of the site that's zoned R9PI, which is the Flower Hill building, would remain unchanged. Um, and then along with the rezoning, uh, the portion of the site that would be rezoned uh, would be mapped as a mandatory inclusionary housing area um, under option two. So approval of these actions would facilitate the construction of three new buildings, which you can see schematically here. Uh, in the first phase of construction, medical operations would be consolidated into a renovated and modernized Flower Hill building, uh, which is the white, and a 150-person supportive housing building found, uh, financed through HPD's Senior Affordable Residential Apartments, or SARA program, would be constructed at the southeast corner, which is in orange. Uh, certain patients at TCC whose, whose level of care is suited to home-based uh, care but who have no safe home to return to would be moved into the supportive housing facility. The supportive housing building would be entirely affordable and would fulfill the applicant's MIH obligation. After the health facility construction is complete, ArchCare would partner with a developer to construct a residential tower on the northeast corner of the site. They would also construct a program for all-inclusive care for the elderly facility, which, or PACE, which would be at the, it's just in the blue, sort of at the base of the residential building. And required parking would also be provided, access from 106th Street. Here you can see the site plan showing the position of the buildings uh, on the site. The proposed tower, residential tower, would be approximately 32 stories tall uh, with a height of 356 feet approximately. And it would include uh, approximately 379 residential units, uh, an additional share of which would be affordable um, but pursuant to 421A. So to facilitate this new development, the applicant is proposing to rezone the R72 portion of the site to R8. R72 and R8 actually have the same community facility FAR of 6.5. However, the maximum residential FAR for R8 is 6.02 versus only 3.44 for R72. And R8 also has lower open space ratios, so it makes it easier to utilize all the floor area. So the overall zoning lot of TCC, which means the existing to remain Flower Hill building and the three new buildings, would have approximately 650,000 square feet, about half of which would be residential. The blended FAR of the proposed FAR of the proposed development would be 7.75. So this reflects the mix between the R9 and the proposed R8 portion of the lot. Um, as, as I showed in the previous slide, because the community facility FARs are not different between R72 and R8, the overall floor area allowed would not change with the proposed rezoning. But the portion of that floor area that could be used for residential would uh, be increased. So the applicant intends to construct the proposal as shown on, on the previous slides, um, but there is no development partner on board as of yet, so it's important to note that the commission is only approving the zoning map change, um, which would allow the applicant to use their allowable floor area as of right within the sky exposure planes shown here. So just in summary, uh, the applicant is Arch Care is requesting a zoning map change from R72, R72C15 to R8, R8C15, and an amendment to Appendix F 
F to map an MIH area on the site. Approval of the actions would facilitate the construction of a new supportive housing building, a new elder care facility, and a private residential tower. And approval would also indirectly facilitate the modernization of TCC's Flower Hill facility. So I'm happy to take any questions now. Questions from the commission. Vice Chair Knuckles. Well, you said there's no developer uh, identified yet, but I, I did have a question about sequencing. Hmm. Uh, one, uh, with the private developer, whoever he or she turned out to be, would they do the entire development, the construction of not only the private uh, uh, residen uh, the residential project, but the other components as well? And two, how would they be sequenced? Uh, which buildings would come first? Yeah, so in terms of the sequencing of which buildings would come first, that um, the modernization of the existing building and the supportive housing would come first, and then the residential tower and the uh, PACE facility, which is the elder care facility, would come second. I'm not sure, though, whether the development partner would construct everything, all the new development. Um, I'd have to get back to you about that. But I do know that some of the renovation and modernization work of the existing building is actually already underway. Um, so presumably that they're doing that separately. Yeah. So they're waiting for the land use uh, pro uh, process to... Yeah, to RFP and... They do the uh, outreach for development? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Bernie. Um, could you go to slide 12? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I think in general, this is a massive improvement of what's there now, <laughs> so that's true. But I'm a little bit worried about this green open space at grade. It looks to me like one of those spaces where dogs go to poop and pigeons go to die, and it's not a healthy addition to the streetscape. So how is that going to work? Yeah, so this is, you know, highly schematic, as you can see, and that's because, uh, as I mentioned, there is no developer sure. partner on board. And this is, an R8 is a height factor district, and they're construct, they're proposing to construct according to height factor regulations, which do require certain setbacks. Um, we had discussed that, especially along Madison Avenue, uh, a sidewalk uh, expansion would be more appropriate than this you know, any sort of yard area. And I think that is what they're considering for at least Madison and 105th well, Street, even though. I but, mean, that works yeah. well if the sidewalk's expanded. Right. But that's not, that's private property, that little sliver of green, isn't it? Yes. So it's one thing that it becomes public domain and we mm -hmm. have the benefit of a great sidewalk, which would be terrific. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll be a happy outcome if there's some sort of fence and then, you know, the miserable bit of dead grass behind it, which we always get. Mm -hmm. I think that should be addressed somehow. Yeah, and that's, I think, the kind of thing that yeah, we can talk to the applicant about addressing before it comes back to the Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Eady. Hi. Has there been any discussion of maybe including some retail overlay on the Madison Avenue piece? Yes, there would be a retail overlay um, that they would retain the existing C15 commercial overlay, but um, whether there would actually be retail in the, f in the facility, as of now, their proposal does not call for that. but. Uh, yeah. Given the fact that it's Madison Avenue, it is a retail corridor, and there's, you know, a lot of residential, especially the public housing on the east side, I guess, which precludes retail. Mm -hmm. I think putting it here would be a, a real improvement. Yeah, that's. Commissioner Ortiz. Uh, I, my comment was actually a combination of, of both of those. Um, you know, noting that 106 is a wide street, that there is um, retail on that northwest corner, um, and that at first glance, at least, there are very few um, sort of service or retail mm -hmm. um, businesses in the vicinity. And we have uh, major institutions um, close by that bring visitation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's surprising that we don't have anything there, and, and it, it would be an asset, I would, I would imagine. Um, you know, on, on the, the setback, you know, I'm, I'm back and forth on that issue um, frequently because I, I have seen, um, you know, even some of our dense districts, you know, two or three feet of setback um, with some landscaping, you know, especially if we have ground floor um, residential, mm -hmm. if there's no commercial in this location, um, can give some privacy mm -hmm. um, to those first floor units and can be done nicely, but mm -hmm. you know, we never, we don't control that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's something to be very mindful of here. And I understand this is just a rezoning that we're looking at schematics. Commissioner De La Luz. 
Um, so, I mean, a couple of questions for when this uh, comes back. Um, more information, I think, about the phasing and about any impact on existing patients um, as a result of this would be helpful. Um, what processes um, arch care needs to go through, I'm assuming there's an oversight with the state, mm -hmm. and it would be helpful to understand what that entails. Um, did I understand in your presentation that there's no MIH units in the residential tower? Proposed? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So this is this has an offsite MIH. It's it's not offsite because it's on the zoning lot, but the supportive housing building would fulfill the MIH obligation. Um, although the, the applicant has said that the residential tower will be developed most likely pursuant to 421 and have additional affordable units, but the MIH units would be fulfilled through the supportive housing building. Well, it would be helpful to get clarification also then about the, the Affordable New York or the 421A units. Um, and then the rationale for MIH option two versus option one would be helpful, especially since they're going to be developing, uh, well, I, I can imagine the answer to that, but it would be helpful to get that answer. Sure. And then, um, and then do we have a precedent for the proposed blending of the FAR? I mean, is that something that has happened before, and if so, where? He, yes, generally when the zoning lot, this is all controlled by one applicant, mm -hmm. and it's one zoning lot, and it's actually also only two tax lots. One of the tax lots spans the Flower Hill building and sort of the residential tower component. And generally, um, yes, when it's one zoning lot, based on the proportion of the of the lot that is within the zone, you blend the units. The but, but I guess the question I have has, has to do more with the shifting from the community facility FAR to the residential FAR. Have we seen that before? So the maybe I can clarify that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but the the, the, the the slide was just sort of showing the the overall FAR because this is a community facility mm -hmm. um, space, or there it includes component of community facility. The overall FAR would be the same. Um, they would I get just that. Have to it's just they seem to be getting an additional benefit. I guess it's no right. So they're filling up a larger proportion of that overall sort of with the floor area with residential valuable. by adding this right. this rezoning exactly. Yes. Yeah, so that was the. And in terms of precedent, yeah. yes, so the R72 is widely mapped and we have definitely rezoned from R72 to R8 and, and given the residential floor area increase and then the, the community facility stays the same. That's a, it's happened before. So we've shifted that much FAR from community facility to residential. We've allowed them to build more residential, um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Other question, Commissioner Levin. Um, and in the blending, is the uh, senior, the supportive housing, is that counting as community facility FAR or as residential? Uh, community facility. Okay, so the, the resi what's shown here as the 3.89 is the uh, tower. Yes, because uh, if a supportive housing building would count as a nonprofit institution with sleeping accommodations. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, then this application is certified. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 3, page 21, is a certification of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 2. Our presenter is Sylvia Lee. Good afternoon, Commissioners. <laughs> we can see it happening on the yeah, little screen there. Really happening. Um. You can begin if you All right. feel comfortable. I don't know what's going on. Great, right, great. Uh -huh. um, um, this is a private application requesting the grant of a good faith marketing special permit pursuant to section 74781 of the zoning resolution to allow use group six retail uses on portions of the uh, floors below the level of second story in a new 10 story commercial building located at 363 Lafayette Street within an M15B zoning district in NoHo, Manhattan Community District two. In the 
presentation. You can, you can, okay. you can hear um, you. So if you want to tell him which one right. it is, you can. It's in the, Jeff, it's in the, uh, yeah, it's in the presentation folder. Mm -hmm. yeah, please yeah. Um, all right. Construction of the building. <laughs> Uh, this is the first slide. Um, construction of the building is nearly complete. Um, the, sh the, um, uh, the picture on the slide um, is a rendering uh, of the building at the corner of Lafayette and Great Jones Street. Um, Slide two, I believe, um, is the area map. Um, as shown, the project site occupies the entire frontage of Lafayette Street uh, and additionally fronts on Great Jones Street. Here we are. I think it's going to come Jeff. up. Right, great. Um, slide two, um, the project site occupies the entire frontage of Lafayette Street uh, and additionally fronts on Great Jones Street and Bond Street. The, the Bond Street front is very narrow, about um, eight feet. The site is within the M15B district. Um, as you're aware, um, the district um, does not permit use group six retail uses below the level of second story. Um, the pre predominant uses within the surrounding area, however, are ground floor retail with commercial offices upstairs, including a, a variety of dwelling units with different statuses. Um, active manufacturing industrial uses are very rarely found uh, in the area these days. Um, while some of the lots colored here on this area map based on Pluto data um, are colored uh, industrial, which is purple, um, based on the department's understanding of the surrounding area, with the exception of uh, one um, establishment on Bond Street, which is actually close to the site, um, this one, the southern uh, frontage of Bond Street, it is a scrap metal um, establishment. Um, there is no active manufacturing industrial uses in the surrounding area. There was um, one that was active here at the uh, Tool and Die, which recently featured in a New York Times article, which is very interesting. Um, other than that, um, the area is largely commercial with residential above. Um, adjacent street frontages at the intersection of project site um, Lafayette Street and Great Jones Street are generally um, occupied by ground floor retail. Um, with exception of the Edison parking lot immediately north of the project site, which is this big um, gray site. The irregularly shaped zoning lot measures a little over 5,500 square feet with about 200 feet of frontage on Lafayette Street uh, and about 50 feet along Great Jones Street. Um, as shown on the building section, um, the applicant proposes to use the ground floor, the cellar, and subcellar for use group six retail uses. Um, the second and the third floor um, floors of the building would be occupied by community facility. It's a house of worship. Um, the rest of the upper floors will be occupied by offices. As part of the special permit, the applicant proposes to use about 4,800 square feet of floor area on the ground floor and about a total uh, 6,300 gross square feet of retail in the cellar and subcellar levels for retail uses. Um, Section 74781 and the good faith marketing provisions allow the commission to uh, modify the use regulations in the M15B district to allow retail uses below the level of second story, provided that certain findings regarding the owner's good faith marketing efforts could be made. Uh, 363 Lafayette Street is a building with a lot coverage over 3,600 square feet. Therefore, the marketing period is required to be no less than one year. Uh, beginning in October 2017, for a period of over a year, the applicant actively pursued marketing efforts to rent uh, the subject space for conforming uses. Um, details of the marketing efforts are provided in uh, your packages. Uh, in sum, the applicant seeks a good faith marketing special permit to allow retail uses below the level of the second story. Happy to answer any questions. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Levin. I'm very glad to see something like this come along. As this site has been big for a long time, it, it was a skeleton of a zombie building for many, many, many years, <laughs> and it's great to see it finally get built. Um, but it's just intriguing to think about how to apply 74781 to new construction. Right. Um, have we ever done that before? Um, um, how can you effectively market space that doesn't exist? 
it's not surprising to me that, well, we know that we know the the realities of the good faith marketing effort, and the. I don't think in my time on the commission we have ever found um, space that effectively got taken up as a result of the advertising. It's inevitable that the marketing is unsuccessful and that we end up approving um, retail use. Um, but. Has it ever been used for non-existent space? Uh, yes. So the not recently. I think the last one the commission approved was um, Crosby Street Hotel, um, and that was in the early, I think early to late 2000s, um, where um, and as a right hotel was being proposed on the site. So above the level of the ground floor, everything is as a right. However, the lobby, in order to allow the hotel lobby, as well as accessory eating and drinking establishment on the ground floor, the applicant at the time had to seek a good faith marketing special permit uh, with regards to market. So that was an example. And previously, there have been a number of examples that I can um, uh, pull together uh, as a follow-up. Uh, in terms of the uh, the ability to market space, I think this is it's not really uncommon when a, a development is being proposed on a site or being uh, built uh, while the marketing um, and the the search for tenants uh, is ongoing. Uh, so I think that's akin to it. Um, but this does get into this interesting question about um, uh, the usefulness of the, the existing zoning regulations in Soho and Noho these days, uh, given how much the area has changed since 1971. Uh, these ground floor regulations were put in place to, to support the shrinking manufacturing industries at the time, um, which um, no longer serves um, the public purposes, purposes is served back then. Right. Yeah. No, I know you're in the trenches of the um, discussion that's going on in the neighborhood about um, the existing zoning, and I expect we'll hear much more about it when this comes back for public hearing. But. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, I have a, a rather technical question, and it's not necessarily related to this building per se, but, you know, we're being... Uh, the material here um, indicates that there will be over 11,000 square feet of retail, of which um, actually the majority um, is in the cellar and sub-cellar. So, um, you know, we're th thinking about how we measure um, things like vacancies and how much retail square footage we have. Um, you know, I, I see this here in this document. Um, following you know, should this proposal succeed and they move ahead. Um, how is this space then, how do we go back and determine the use of a space like this? It's not FAR, right? It's not considered FAR, at least the seller and subseller. Um, you know, how do we how do we track what is retail space versus what is not retail space um, subsequent to something like this? Um, I think that is a question that reflective of the changing kind of usage of, of below grade floor area um, that is beyond just the scope of this application or even in Absolutely. I However, my question. Um, I want to make two, maybe two clarifications, one specifically on this project. Um, while the applicant is seeking the use group six retail waiver on all floors below the level of second story, the intention is as actually to use portions of the seller with sub seller uh, as part of the house of worship on the upper floors of the building. The reason to seek the wa waiver to cover the entire cellar and sub-cellar spaces is to allow the flexibility in terms of layout um, uh, and determining, you know, uh, down the line, which portions of the cellar space would be dedicated to house of worship. Um, getting back to your question about tracking, I think department buildings is the agency that would, by issuing CFOs, um, uh, noting um, what spaces are used, how, person to what regulations. Um, um, you are correct in observing that a lot of these below grade spaces, which previously used for accessory storage for retail, are now more often utilized as active st um, uh, store um, and s uh, sales space. Mm -hmm. um, and you're seeing that more and more in this district right. in particular. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Ram Prashad. Just a technical question. Uh, Lafayette Street, it says 80 feet as a wide street, but the dimensions in between the blocks show it less than 75. I think it's 70 and 68. So shouldn't it be a narrow street? 
labeled as a narrow street? Just, um, just. I can't. We can get back to you. Yeah, yes. Fine. Streets in Soho are generally mapped. Barry, can you just come to the? Barry, if you could come up and speak in the microphone. In, in Soho, some of the streets are mapped wider than they're actually built. So the map may show it as wider, but the street in actuality may be narrower. Okay. I can go back to you in terms of the yeah, de designation of the wide street versus narrow street. Appreciate your always eagle eye. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Commissioner Dweck. Again, we don't have any financial parameters on uh, the term good faith, do we? Um, I believe the commission will have to <laughs> determine what's good faith effort. Um, the the applicant has engaged um, brokers um, to determine the appropriate rent um, for such marketing efforts, and um, as usual, the applicant also um, discussed with the department um, uh, in you know in consultation with the department, come up with um, a reasonable rent. Um, and so far, I think, as you've seen in other applications, applicants typically seek um, to rent the space as a, um, at a rate of $80 per square foot, which is way below market for retail uses in the area. However, it's, it's been, you know, said, you know, among the commissioners that it is hardly affordable rent for for manufacturing um, right. tenants. However, with the lack of local industrial market, it's very difficult to determine what is the reasonable industrial rent in this neighborhood. Uh, and one last question, just a technical question. The special permits, they're issued in perpetuity or is it when a renew, when, a, when you have a lease renewal, does, do they lapse and need to be renewed? Um, typically, special permits are issued with a term of four years, uh, renewable for two times, uh, three-year terms. Good. However, once, re once issued and the space is occupied pursuant to a special permit, you are allowed to, to continue occupying the space for the use that, that's been approved. I would say those are special permits that relate to construction. This is a special permit with respect to use. So, so the, they, they have to occupy it yeah, within yeah. four years. Right. right. But, but once it's occupied, right. then they're, they're in perpetuity. Right. Correct? I, I, I have to look at the, the if, text. If you discontinue the use for two years right. or more, yes. yeah. you are required to come back. either uh, come back yeah, right. for yeah. another special yeah. permit yes, or true. occupy for as of right uses. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, Sylvia, can we assume that uh, in the advertisement for this space that JLL provided renderings or and plans for uh, what the space would look like, or should we not? Um, I can ask the applicant to provide additional information on the marketing materials that's sent out, but uh, I believe as part of the marketing material, floor plans um, are usually included. Um, but on newspaper ads, Given the space limitation, I, I don't yeah, think I wouldn't expect any. them to be in yeah. here. But I mean, right. assuming someone pursued this, right? With with those uh, the visuals. materials shared, um, yeah. I can ask the applicant to to provide more information. I I do not know the answer. Other questions? Okay. So this application is certified. Point. Thank you. Yeah. Item four, page 46, is a certification of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 1. Our presenter is Allison Brown. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'll just uh, begin, if that's okay. Yeah, you can so, see if he's working on there. But. 121 Chamber Street, LLC, seeks approval for a special permit for landmark preservation in all districts in order to facilitate a high increase of an existing five-story, three-block building located in 121 Chamber Street and 103 Reed Street within the Tribeca South Historic District. The site, located in here in red, is a through lot between Chamber Street and Reed Street, located in a block bounded by Church Street to the east and West Broadway to the west within the Tribeca neighborhood of Lower Manhattan. The site is located in a C63A zoning district in area A3 of the Special Tribeca Mixed Use District. 
the allowed FAR in this district is 7.52 for residential uses, 6 for commercial uses, and 7.5 for community uses. The surrounding area is well served by public transportation, including access to the ACE, RW12345 and 6 subway lines, and uh, several bus lines serving the surrounding area, including the M5, 9, 20, and 22. Uh, shown here in the red dashed line is the boundaries of the Tribeca South Historic District in which the site um, exists. The boundaries of the Tribeca West Historic District and Tribeca South um, and Tribeca South Historic District Extension are located in adjacent blocks to the development site. The area within 600 feet of the development site consists of mostly five and six story mixed use buildings. Most of the buildings were constructed as commercial loft buildings, many of which have been converted to residential use above the ground floor with stores and restaurants on the ground floor. There are also a number of LPC designated individual landmarks in the area, including the Cary building, which is located on the same block as the development site. The development site is a 150 foot deep, 25 foot wide through block building with frontages on both Chambers Street shown on the left and Reed Street shown on the right. The existing building is um, vacant. Uh, it's a five story building plus cellar and sub cellar. Prior to becoming vacant in 2017, the building contained ground floor, retail and upper, upper um, floor rental units. There's five market rate residential units. The interior of the building is currently undergoing an as of right construction. The existing building contains 18,000 square feet of floor area and an FAR 4.95. The street wall of the existing building extends to a height of 75 feet one inch on Chambers Street and 75 feet 11 inches on Reed Street. As mentioned previously, the site is located in Tribeca South Historic District. Most of the buildings in the historic district were constructed in the 1850s and 60s for textile and dry good merchants. Uh, the buildings in the district are historically Italianate style storefront and loft buildings, typically with cast iron storefronts on the ground floor. 121 Chamber Street and 103 Reed Street was con constructed in 1860 and was originally used by importers of wholesale importers and wholesalers of liquor, hardware, cutlery, and luggage. Uh, the 1992 LPC designation report describes the site as a contributing building in the overall historic character of the South Tribeca neighborhood. The applicant is proposing to construct a two-story vertical enlargement to the existing building and add new mezzanines between the second and third floors and between the fourth and fifth floors as part of as of right interior alterations. Uh, here we see elevations of the existing and proposed buildings seen in elevation view from both frontages. The proposed development would be a seven-story mixed-use building plus cellar and sub-cellar with residential uses on the second through seventh floor and retail on the first floor there would be eight market rate residential units. The development would contain approximately 24,000 square feet of floor area and an FAR of 6.52, less than the maximum amount permitted. Seen here in cross section, we can see that the enlargement would extend through the through block building with a 20 foot setback from the street wall at the sixth floor on both Chamber Street and Reed Street. For the seventh floor, there would be a 44 foot setback from Chamber Street and a 20 to 24 foot setback from Reed Street. Um, in conjunction with the proposed enlargement, the applicant will also be undertaking several renovations, including restoring all storefronts to the original 19th century appearance. Um, here we see a rendering of the proposed facades exposing and restoring all decorative parts of cast iron elements, removing the non-original fire escapes on Reed Street, cleaning and making repairs to sandstone facades, and replacing all 24 windows. Um, here we see an aerial view of the um, Chamber Street frontage, highlighted here in green. We can see that it extends through the through block to Reed Street. And here is the proposed building. So I'll just toggle back and forth between these two so we can see the difference. And again, highlighted in green, we can see where um, the building from Chamber Street is set back 20 feet um, for the six story enlargement, 44 feet from the, um, for the seven story enlargement. And here on Reed Street, we can see that uh, 24 foot setback um, of, the, of a small uh, balcony on one side of the building. Oh, sorry. Um, so the proposed waivers, in order to achieve the proposed enlargement, the applicant is requesting waivers for height. 
The applicant seeks a special permit pursuant to ZR section 74711, Landmark Preservation in All Districts, for a waiver of the height enlargement limit of section 11120C2 in order to allow the construction of a seventh floor and an overall increase in height of 18 feet on the existing building. As the development site is mapped in a C63A zoning district and is located in area A3 of the Special, special Tribeca Mixed Use District, um, narrow buildings in this district may be constructed above the maximum height permitted by section 23692, height limitations for narrow buildings or enlargements, provided such portion does not exceed one story or 15 feet. So again, we see a waiver is needed to allow for one additional story and for an overall increase in 18 feet. In conclusion, um, the Planning Commission may permit mod modification of bulk regulations as long as certain conditions and findings are met, stated here. In regards to the condition, the Landmark Preservation Commission issued a Certificate of Appropriateness in January of 2019, a copy of which is found in the Commission's briefing package. Pursuant to the approval of this application, the applicant will pursue a restrictive declaration in order to meet the conditions of a continued maintenance plan as so forth in the zoning resolution. And in regards to the findings, the commission shall find that bulk modifications shall have minimal adverse effects on the structures or open space in the vicinity in terms of scale, location, and access to light and air. In your briefing sheets, you will find the full description of 74711 as well as the statement of findings provided by the applicants for the commission's review. Questions? Hello. What's, what's the total number of additional square footage that's proposed? It's going from approximately 18,000 square feet to 24,000 square feet, so about 6,000 square feet, okay. roughly. And does the adjacent property um, also have additional FAR if they wanted? I mean, we have lot line windows here. Um, do, oh, do the, do the abutting properties yeah. have the ability to uh, increase in height as well? Um, I will have to look into that and come back to you. Great, thanks. Other questions? The application is certified. Thank you. Item 5, page 85, is a certification of a UDAP designation and disposition of city-owned land in Brooklyn Community District 3. Uh, making his first presentation at the City Planning Commission is Colin Lay. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is an application by the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, HPD, to request the designation and approval of an urban development action area and disposition of city-owned land. This application would facilitate the development of a new nine-story building with 59 affordable units at 776-780 Myrtle Avenue. HPD is also working with Impact Brooklyn on this um, project. The development site is located in Bed-Stuy, Community District 3 in Brooklyn. The surrounding area has a mix of land uses and various building heights up to nine stories. Directly across from the development site is the NYCHA's Marcy Houses. Um, open space in the area includes Marcy Playground, which is across the street from the development site as well. And just south is the Vernon Cases Community Garden. There's a one-story New York City Department of Health building located on North Strand Avenue. And east of the development site on the corner of Myrtle and Marcy is a 10-story as of right mixed-use development um, that's under construction. On the same block of the development site is vacant city-owned land comprised of nine lots. HPD has plans to develop these lots in the future, which would account for an additional 170 units of affordable housing. The surrounding area is well served by trip by public transportation. The Myrtle Willoughby G train stop is located um, east of the development site. And the area is served by the B-54, B-44, and B-43 buses. The site is located on Myrtle Avenue between Neustrand and Marcy Avenue. The area was a part of the Bed-Stuy North rezoning in 2012, which created contextual zoning districts and mapped inclusionary housing areas. The project falls within the R7D district with a C24 commercial overlay. 
R7D primarily consists of medium density residential buildings that allow a 4.2 FAR, a maximum base height of 85 feet, and a maximum building height of 100 feet. For buildings participating in the inclusionary housing program, this district allows up to a 5.6 FAR with a maximum base height of 95 feet and a maximum building height of 100 feet. And C24 commercial overlays require only non-residential ground floor uses at a maximum commercial FAR of 2.0. Of 2 the development site is comprised of three interior lots, 1920 and 22 located on 7,500 square feet of land and 75 feet of frontage on Myrtle Avenue. Lot 19 in the 1980s received approval for disposition of city-owned land, but the site was never sold to another entity, and it still remains under city ownership today. And here are some photos of the development site. The top right is a view from the southwest along Myrtle Avenue. The bottom left is um, northeast along Myrtle Avenue, and the development site is in between those two residential buildings. And the last photo is northeast along Myrtle Avenue, just showing a little bit of the um, built environment in the neighborhood. The proposed development consists of a new construction of a nine-story building with a total of 59 units of affordable rental housing, one superintendent unit, ground floor retail, and supportive service space in the cellar. The proposed building will have a mix of studios, one and two bedrooms. HPD confirmed that they'll be using the supportive housing loan program. Over half of the proposed apartments will be reserved for formerly homeless and low-income individuals and households with 36 studios set aside for the support of housing and the remaining 23 units for um, households earning up to 60% AMI or below. Uh, the building would have a total residential floor area of approximately 39,000 square feet and commercial floor area of uh, approximately 3,100 square feet at an FAR of 5.3. The seller level will include um, social services, administrative services, and programmatic spaces associated with the program's um, proposed development for supporter of housing needs. And building amenities will include uh, storage for parking, community room, laundry room, and various outdoor spaces for tenants. No off-street parking will be required since it's in the transit zone. The proposed building will, the proposed nine-story building will have a height of 97 feet and the ninth floor will have will be set back with, with leaving room for a green roof. Um, typical floor plans will include eight apartments and the ninth floor will include four apartments. And here's a site plan that shows the residential and um, the residential and the commercial entries. Also it shows the rear courtyard and the roofs. And in order to facilitate the proposed project, HPD is requesting a designation and approval of an urban development action area and disposition of city-owned land. Thank you. Questions from the commission. Vice Chair Knuckles. Is this a, a nonprofit uh, developer or, yes. or whom? Yes. It is? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Rompershot. Uh, in the packet we have on the floor plans, I don't see any uh, bathrooms or kitchens. Is there a, a revised floor plan? <laughs> <laughs> on this one. Um, I can ask the architect about that. <laughs> yeah, while you're there, just ask them also on the uh, ground floor level, the, the entrance doors look like they're on the street line. I believe he's got to set them back. Okay, I will definitely ask about that as well. I'll actually note in response to Vice Chair Knuckles' question that IMPACT uh, was previously known as Pratt Community Council. Ah, that's correct. Okay. Other questions? Then assuming that these units do have bathrooms, uh, the application is certified. Okay. I, I, I would just note, uh, Madam Chair, with uh, now two architects uh, on, on the commission, uh, I think there'll be a lot more scrutiny to, uh, to, uh, to layouts. Uh, well, I would actually, bathrooms. I would actually know three architects because we have Orlando and four trained as architects, including yes, you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Hey, uh, item six, page 106, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 2. Our presenter is Blake Monteith. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a private application to facilitate the development of a new mixed residential and commercial building in Lyon City, Queens, Community District 2. The owner of a development site near the intersection of 45th Avenue and 23rd Street seeks relief from bulk regulations defined in the special Long Island City Mixed Use District in order to significantly reduce their overall tower height and create more efficient floor plans. The proposed development would include about 250 market rate residential units above eight stories of commercial space, including retail and office uses. The applicant also int intends to pursue an as of right option to provide subway improvements to the Court Square station in exchange for additional development rights. The applicant is still negotiating these details, details of these improvements with the MTA. The, the Court Square subdistrict of the special Long Island City District is shown here in the center in red and is surrounded by three subway stations. The subdistrict, shown here in a dotted black line, includes three blocks. Block three is shown here in red at the southern end of the subdistrict. And the area surrounding block three is highly mixed use with a historic district located to the west of the block. The development site includes five multifamily walk-up buildings and a zoning lot merger would add a two and three story uh, building at the intersection of Jackson Avenue and 45th Avenue, but only the lots shown here in red would be redeveloped. The Toy uh, Toyoko Inn, an international hotel company, also plans to build a new hotel on the adjacent lot four shown here in yellow. The proposed text amendment would alter the street wall height and setback requirements along the 23rd Street and 45th Avenue frontages of Block 3. Along the 23rd Street frontage, there is a 60-foot tower setback area shown here in red and with an A with a maximum street wall height of 85 feet. The proposed amendment would reduce the, the tower setback to 20 feet and raise the maximum base height to 125 feet. Along 45th Avenue, the underlying tower encroachment rules associated with the C53 zoning district uh, require setbacks of 20 feet or more, shown here in green and with a B. The proposed amendment would supersede the tower encroachment rules with a 15-foot tower setback and an 85-foot street wall height. The proposed actions would allow the applicant to expand the typical tower floor plate from 3,375 square feet to 6,300 square feet. And based on the current court square subdistrict requirements, the applicant could build about a 70-story tower to maximize the available floor area. This as of right tower would be taller than the city core tower and that is currently the tallest tower in Long Island City. The applicant seeks to overall lower the height of the tower to 45 stories to reduce construction expenses and create a more efficient building floor plan. At the last review session, the commission asked a question about noise attenuation, especially along uh, the 23rd Street facade facing the elevated railway. Um, while the applicant will be available on Wednesday to, to talk about their specific proposals for this building, I, I do want to note that an e-designation would be applied to the site if the proposed actions are approved that would require uh, development on this site to maintain interior noise levels at a level no greater than 45 decibels for residential units and 50 decibels for commercial uses. 45 decibels is comparable to birds chirping and 50 decibels is comparable uh, to uh, a residential refrigerator. So very quiet levels inside the building. Um, they could choose from a number of options to mitigate uh, the noise from the tracks. This could include small window sizes, air gaps within the windows, thicker glazing, among many other features. Um, and the applicant or, or the developer would be required to provide an alternative means of ventilation to opening the window. They could still open the windows, uh, uh, but, but something like air conditioning would need to be provided if the windows are closed. 
On April 4th, Queens Community Board 2 voted to approve this application with the condition that the applicant provide a community facility space uh, for the Queens Library, uh, an arts organization, or another Queens-based nonprofit organization. Uh, the community board asked for no less than 10,000 square feet for community facility uses and that this space be leased at no more than $10 per square foot for a period of at least 20 years. The Queensboro president did not hold a public hearing or submit a recommendation. And I'm happy to answer your questions. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Burney. Did the um, Queen's Public Library opine on this? Do they, do they want a branch library there, and is 10,000 Squeak big enough? Um, they have not specifically uh, uh, commented on this, on this proposal, but they have been in communication with the applicant. The Queen's Library currently has a branch in the City Core Tower, but their lease negotiation is coming up, so they may need to go to another space. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Continuing that, how, how big a space do they have in the city corp tower? Is it in the neighborhood of 10,000 square feet? It's smaller than 10,000 square feet, but I can provide specifics. Okay. Um, and just to be clear, we're only amending the text for this block of the subdistrict. Exactly. So this is the only site to which this text might apply? Um, well, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, uh, to answer your question. It does apply to another site on this block, um, to the uh, um, uh, Toyoko the site. The hotel site. Um, um, but it, it's a very small change to the site, and, and we don't believe that, that this would really cause the hotel to change its form in any way. Okay, and uh, any potential um, impact on the white space in the upper right-hand corner, the so that would be part of the zoning lot. Right, um, um, so to which this might apply, but. So it, 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 the um, uh, changes to the tower encroachment rules could potentially apply there, but the applicant is proposing to use all the development rights from, from that lot. Ha, huh. okay, good, thank you. Other questions? Then we'll see this at the public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. Okay, item seven, page 125, is a post referral for a city planning commission certification for a transit easement in Manhattan Community District 3. The MTA, in accordance with the text, have sent a letter stating that no easement is needed at this location. That uh, letter is in your package. Um, the Manhattan office is here to answer any questions. If there are no questions, then I will ask for an assent by show of hands to send a letter to the Department of Buildings saying that no easement is required. Okay, it's done. Okay. Uh, for future votes, uh, staff have prepared reports for April 10th public hearing uh, for the CD3 sanitation garage in Brooklyn Community District 1, uh, the Brownsville North NCP, uh, 47-15 34th Avenue. I would note that there's a proposed modification. The Haven Green project. I just wanted to compliment the drafter of that report. It's um, very tightly written with a lot of useful detail in it. And that would be um, Kiyoshi with a little help from his friends. <laughs> Uh, Haven Green is actually Sylvia. Oh, Haven Green, I'm sorry. <laughs> Haven Green Sylvia. is Sylvia. I we were right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 66 Hudson Yard Streetscape. <laughs> and the Residential Mechanical Voids Text Amendment also note the proposed modification. And that was Nabila and Kiyoshi uh, primarily. There's a group effort there. <laughs> Um, Those were two tricky reports just because of the technical nature of describing in a way that was accessible to the public. Also scheduled for decision, uh, 5011 Waldo Avenue. I'm not going to try that one. Uh, it's a SNAD authorization. Uh, 4637 uh, Grosvenor Avenue, the Pappas residence, and the Wave Hill Gardens uh, SNAD authorization. Okay. 
for post-hearing follow-ups, uh, we have Joe Helferty here uh, to discuss the Bay Street corridor. Uh, good afternoon again, commissioners. Um, we are here today to discuss our uh, final post-hearing follow-up for the Bay Street Corridor Neighborhood Plan, uh, which was certified in November 13th of 2018. Um, I will not reiterate this to you again, but as you recall, the Bay Street Corridor Neighborhood Plan uh, is aimed towards establishing a medium density mixed use corridor, as well as other land use actions on the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, the previous topics discussed on March 11th and 25th, uh, with today's focus being primarily on outstanding zoning questions, um, housing needs, specifically uh, what we heard during outreach and a memo submitted by HPD, which should be in your packets, and other uh, slash emergency services. So first regarding uh, zoning. So uh, as per the borough president's recommendation and uh, questions raised by the commission uh, regarding the inclusion of text that would allow for uh, physical, cultural, or health establishments to exist as of right within the special district. Uh, there are some questions raised as to this provision. Uh, so as a reminder, a PCE is a facility which is designed to uh, improve the physical condition uh, of a person through exercise or massage, and today a PCE would require a BSA special permit. Uh, this can be a disincentive to uses that promote public health, specifically for smaller uh, PCEs. Uh, and again, the borough president raised the concern of this provision, um, citing that it may encourage less desirable uses, um, such as illicit uses that can uh, accompany massage establishments. So the department's proposal to uh, remove the need for this special permit within the special Bay Street Corridor District uh, is aligned with uh, DCP's prior efforts um, to try and uh, remove the impediment to these types of uses. Uh, this is something that's been uh, included in uh, other special districts for quite some time now. I would say uh, most notably in 2006 in the adjacent Stapleton Waterfront Special District. Uh, so this shares a boundary with our proposed Bay Street District, uh, as well as in more recently approved neighborhood studies and rezoning, such as East Harlem, Jerome Avenue, and Inwood. Uh, today on Staten Island, there are approximately 16 standalone spa and massage establishments. However, only one of them has actually received that BSA special permit. Uh, and we would just like to reiterate that the zoning itself does not permit uh, or encourage the illicit uses, uh, nor does having obtained that special permit preclude law enforcement from being able to enforce the applicable laws and regulations. And we do not believe that the removal of this um, portion of the provision from our zoning text would be appropriate at this time. Okay, uh, on to housing need. Um, so as I mentioned before in your packet, HPD had submitted a memo to the commission um, based on questions uh, that were requested of them at the public hearing. Um, so first I'd like to just note that uh, you may notice that some of the numbers, facts, and figures are slightly different than what was previously presented at certification. Uh, this is because newer uh, ACS data has become available. However, I'd just like to point out that the relationships in general have stayed the same despite the figures having changed. So as you can see in the chart on the upper right corner of the screen, uh, Staten Island's Community District 1 has a median income that is lower than that of Staten Island as a whole, but still higher than that of New York City as a whole. Um, the household incomes on the North Shore uh, more closely resemble that of New York City than they do of Staten Island, as is indicated by the chart on the uh, lower right-hand corner. And you can also see that 26% of the North Shore's residents are learning le earning less than 30% of the area median income, um, which is quite notably different than Staten Island's statistic of 18% earning that same uh, amount. In looking at the rental versus owner populations on Staten Island, uh, you can see that approximately 50% of North Shore's households are renters, the other 50 being homeowners. Um, and it's also important to note that you know, amongst this rental population, we see a substantially uh, higher portion of lower income earners, specifically 26% um, of households, uh, pardon me, uh, 44% of the district's rental population earning less than $25,000 uh, per year. Uh, additionally, we can see here that rent burden on the North Shore is substantially higher than that of the borough as a whole, with over half of the population experiencing rent burden, uh, including 30% uh, who uh, are experiencing severe rent burden. 
Regarding the housing, housing market itself, as is outlined in the HPD uh, memo, the North Shore has not seen uh, rents rise quite as fast as the rest of the city between 2000 and 2016, which is uh, indicated on the chart to the right. Uh, and while this might suggest a lack of demand, it may also suggest a lack of quality rental options, which is something that uh, both the department and HPD have heard um, repeatedly through our outreach process, that due to lack of supply, there is a limited number of quality rental options. Uh, in addition, uh, at the time of creation for the MIH program, a market and financial study was undertaken to help inform the MIH options that would be made applicable through zoning resolution, and in doing so, looked at the market conditions on Staten Island, which at the time uh, indicated a moderate market, which was the second lowest rating uh, for housing markets throughout the city, um, specifically with regard to the median condominium sale price and gross rents. Um, we'd also like to share with you some of the feedback that we heard through our outreach um, from both community groups and elected officials regarding affordability and applicable MIH options. Um, so in general, the majority of Staten Island is quite low density, and we've heard from many people that this often uh, limits the type and quality of rental options that they experience, not just on the North Shore, but in the borough as a whole. Um, many members of the community see the housing that could be facilitated through the Bay Street corridor rezoning, not just serving this particular community or the North Shore, uh, but really the entirety of the island, since there is not, um, you know, this type of housing does not really exist elsewhere in the borough. We've heard from many uh, local groups and elected officials that they'd like for the MIH options that are uh, adopted with this proposal to serve the broadest range of incomes to reflect the um, income data that we previously shared with you. Uh, and also divergent opinions on the inclusion of MIH options three and four. So civic groups and, and housing advocates are have uh, widely differing opinions on which of these is most appropriate for the community. And while we see a demonstrable need for option three based on the income uh, data and analysis that we've previously shared with you, uh, the market conditions of the area also do support the inclusion of option four, which is designed to preserve uh, housing production and enable smaller developments to provide affordable housing without uh, any subsidy. And as a reminder to the commission, uh, the application before you proposes to map all four MIH options uh, for both the Bay Street and Canal Street corridor rezonings. Uh, so in addition to MIH, I would also like to provide the commission with a reminder of uh, certain elements of HPD's draft housing plan, which was released uh, at the time of certification, specifically the strategies that are uh, designed to preserve uh, Staten Island's existing affordable housing stock. Um, so programs such as offering loans and tax incentives to building owners to preserve affordable units um, have been recently successfully implemented, uh, such as on the Fox Hill apartments on Staten Island, as well as uh, numerous outreach, education, and marketing events to make homeowners uh, aware or renters aware of these types of programs. With regard to tenant protections, uh, HPD has provided free legal service, uh, education events, and uh, resource fairs to make sure that the programs that are available are well known throughout the community. And in addition, proposes to establish a certification of no harassment program within the uh, immediate area, which would target buildings where harassment would be likely and require investigation of this harassment before any demolition or building permits are issued. And lastly, uh, to preserve existing affordable housing, uh, the draft housing plan uh, outlines a series of programs that are designed to help low and moderate income homeowners, most notably the Home Fix program, which provides low income homeowners uh, financing that they need to be able to make the critical repairs to their home and be able to stay in their home, um, as well as providing resources for both homeowners and, and landlords so they're aware of HPD's programs um, and can better manage their properties. And lastly, on other services or emergency services, uh, many questions were submitted to us uh, regarding this particular uh, topic and how it relates to the Bay Street rezoning. There we go, sorry. Um, so as you can see here in the map to the right, this indicates the location of uh, various emergency services uh, with regard to the rezoning areas highlighted in red. Um, so notably to the north, adjacent to the ferry terminal, uh, is the NYPD's 120th precinct, uh, which serves the majority of Staten Island's North Shore. Uh, it's approximately a half mile away. And regarding uh, FDNY or fire safety services, um, 
to the northwest or the west of the rezoning area. Um, the area is served by engine 155, ladder 78, which is approximately three quarter miles away from the rezoning area, as well as engine 153, ladder 77, which is approximately uh, a half mile away from the Bay Street corridor rezoning area to the south and immediately adjacent um, to actually sharing a boundary with the proposed Canal Street rezoning. Um, in sharing this information uh, with the commission, uh, FDNY has also indicated to us that uh, since both of these units are currently serving communities with mid and high density multiple dwellings, unlike the majority of Staten Island, uh, the equipment that they possess as well as their familiarity with the SOPs is such that they would be able to continue to provide uh, adequate levels of service. And lastly, uh, we'd just like to reiterate that in addition to emergency services, uh, there are other regulations that would be applicable to any new construction to improve life safety. So the majority of the North Shore's housing stock consists of smaller wood frame combustible buildings um, that predate any modern uh, building, fire, or electrical code. Whereas any new construction throughout the area would be required to adhere to these regulations, um, providing things such as fi uh, fire resistant construction, stamp pipes and sprinklers, uh, multiple means of egress, as well as emergency preparedness plans, which would all be reviewed by the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department. So I'm aware that this was a random uh, mix of topics, but this is a lot of what was left from uh, our previous follow-up items. Um, so this is uh, concluding our last post-hearing follow-up, and currently uh, the actions before the commission are scheduled for a vote on April 22nd. I think a uh, Chris, the director, Chris Hadwin, would just like to share a couple of words. I, I just wanted to jump off of what Joe said and say that we're very excited about the progress we've made so far and to continue the conversations. Um, we believe that this will be very transformative for the area um, and establishing Bla Bay Street's uh, presence within the changing downtown Staten Island. So uh, I know that uh, we think it provides better connections from existing neighborhoods to the waterfront, that uh, it provides opportunities for new commercial and residential uses, including affordable housing where today no housing is, is allowed. Um, and while we don't yet know the full suite of commitments that will come out of this plan, I do want to say that we've had very productive conversations with you all over the last few weeks, and that is definitely informing ongoing conversations that continue. Um, and so I think, Jerome, earlier there was a presentation that I think demonstrates how these, these processes roll out, and I think we're very excited to continue, hopefully, to move in, into the next stage of these conversations. So thank you. Commissioner Capelli. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Jerome, okay, because this is the standard by which you're going to be judged uh, at, in the future on this. So for the people that you're having conversations with, uh, please feel free to share uh, what happened there uh, because uh, we are uh, going to be uh, watching to see that there are significant contributions made to this area as a result of this plan. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll note that as we were preparing um, before the certification here, we were working very closely with a council member um, who had reached out to the council members of prior rezoning areas to learn how they had gone through it. And I think it has very much informed her constructive engagement with us throughout this. Mm -hmm. Commissioner De La Uz. I, I appreciate all the um, information about uh, housing need and affordability levels, which in my mind just reinforces that option four for MIH doesn't belong as part of a recommendation. Um, I understand that there seems to be a difference of opinion locally, I, um, but I think part of the misunderstanding about uh, what's going on is the fact that the market is already producing units that are affordable to what MIH option four would produce. And if we end up mapping all four of them, we're basically indicating to all the developers that you can build market rate units here and you're going to be locking in that affordability permanently, that that is a benefit, but we're not than producing units at a deeper affordability and given the great need that is outlined here and certainly that we heard about from the groups that came to testify, um, I think we would, um, and, and quite honestly, the fact that there's need even beyond what MIH uh, produces, um, it just seems to me that we would um, be doing the community a very big disservice if we were to map option four. Commissioner Capelli, um, Cirillo, I'm sorry. 
So just a few things. I'm going to go back for a moment to the just to the beginning. I didn't uh, stop you, Joe, through the presentation, the, the follow up. But just um, I just want to address quickly the PCE piece of this just for a moment. And I appreciate the explanation and obviously the reality of what is happening versus what could always happen in certain circumstances with illegality. But I just want to make sure that I am, am clear on this, particularly in the reference in the in the package about the survey. I'm guessing it was a survey of some sort, but a total of 16 standalone establishments exist on Staten Island with only one that received the BSA permit. Well, where did that information come from? Was that a survey? And have these been reported by anybody once they were identified? Um, so it's not a part of any uh, formal analysis that's been released publicly. However, it is based on employment data. Uh, I believe it was 2016 employment data. Um, there is not a uh, you know cohesive database of these particular uses, but uh, based on that employment data and then cross-referencing it with certificates of occupancy and building permits, as well as BSA special permits, uh, our Housing, Economic, and Infrastructure Planning Division kind of put some of those figures together. I'd also just like to note that that statistic is uh, on par with uh, the citywide rate for you know number of that type of establishment and number of um, spas or massage parlors that seek special permit. Okay. Um, <laughs> but now they can all move in here without having to. So. so I, I understand that. So, and again, this does not necessarily infer illegality. I mean, it's a illegal activity, in, in no but way. the use did not receive a special permit for the use. So we, we don't know what's happening, but we know just even in the perfect world with absolute uh, legal activity otherwise, this, these are still not legal permitted uses. permitted uses. As they have not sought the BSA special permit, the yes. I supposedly no, but again, that is not a testament to any illegal or illicit activity. Correct. I, I'm, I'm not being clear on that too, because I, but at the same time, there are uses that would otherwise not be permissible where they're actually operating. But for the fact that they didn't get a special I, permit. I'm, I'm not sure that the data went that far, but potentially, yes, you're right. Okay. So I have a question. Um, once this, if, if this were to be approved, would they then, they would just by operation of law become legal uses? At that point, so th that was that was borough wide. This change would only apply to the special district area of the Bay Street. Oh, I corridor. understand. Okay, and, okay. And okay. I don't know that we uh, that any are operating within Bay Street corridor. Yeah, we we currently do have one uh, PCE oh, uh, crunch crunch gym. So outside of the statistics we just cited, um, which does have a BSA special permit to exist, um, theoretically they would crunch, become right. uh, conforming use and would not need to seek uh, the special permit at the end of their uh, sure. tenure period. And I want to I want to acknowledge the fact that we've narrowed the activity to a very specific activity when this actually applies to gyms and other, you know, physical culture establishments that aren't about, they, they could have that activity within them. Is that correct? I mean, you could have a service that's provided in a gym that provides for massage or other spa related correct, activities. Yes. And of course, that still is an issue whether there's illegal activity taking place in those of things. Course. One has nothing to do with the other. But I, I, I just want to acknowledge the research that was done here and, uh, and the activity. Um, I want, I'm jumping now to the um, sort of the public safety uh, follow up piece of this. And I, I also, you didn't, this wasn't mentioned, but I do want to acknowledge that. Uh, the letter from Commissioner O'Neill yes. was included in our package um, this this past weekend as well, um, and, and obviously his uh, his support of that is to be acknowledged. Let me let me just ask a question, and this is some, perhaps something just from uh, you know my life in in public service I should know, but I, I'm not sure. I understand, and 
and uh, recognize what has been presented here in terms of the fire department and where the uh, the fire companies um, are located and that they believe, based on some of the questions that have been posed about, you know, do they have the apparatus to serve um, this kind of development, that the answer was yes. But is there a formula regarding the siting of fire companies, firehouses, ladder companies, with respect to total population at some point? Because the population increase here is potentially quite significant in an area that doesn't have that, you know, we're talking, it could be 7,000 people. So aside from the apparatus question, which, you know, in, in the world today, the fire department believes they can handle this, but is there a point or a formula that the city imposes to make determinations about future needs in this area? And if so, what impact does that have? So I think a couple different thoughts in there. One is Seeker has that formula and speaks to when you're introducing a significant new population in an area essentially without, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but in an area without existing fire service. And so it did that analysis and determined that there was no need for additional analysis or, or a significant adverse impact here. So Seeker did that analysis at sort of that higher level. I, I, I actually remember that. There was that paragraph about that this was not an area where we were building a neighborhood where there wasn't already a neighborhood. But I think you have to look at that in terms of how it was defining that. So I mean, the way that it was defining that was in an area without existing fire service. Here we have, you know, multiple um, um, stations that would serve this area. So then from there, we did have conversations with FDNY based on questions that were posed by the commission and, and others. Um, and they, you know, also agreed that the apparatus and that the, you know, uh, stations that they have in place are sufficient to handle the additional growth. So, I mean, we have had those conversations on both, okay. both sides. Of, of it. Okay. And, and then lastly, I just want to um, sort of reflect for a minute on the, on the issue of, um, of housing and the options that are available. I mean, obviously, um, I know that I know that the administration recognized in its application that providing for all of the options possible was um, was a, a prudent way to proceed. I also recall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the creation of the workforce option was created specifically for a, a community and a market like this, if not specifically <laughs> for communities in Staten Island that wanted to grow a new neighborhood that had availability and options for everyone because this was not merely going to serve the, commu the community it was being built in, but hopefully it was going to serve a community beyond the community it was being built in. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, help uh, me a little bit with uh, that. I think your recollection is correct. I think, you know, when we went back and looked at the C and first of all, we're in no ways discounting the need that we see in the deepest affordabilities either. I and, think the income and I'm levels, not either. I, I'm right. not either. And so I think the income levels certainly demonstrate that there is a need there. I think when you go back and look at the CPC report for MIH when it was developed, the workforce option as I understand it from, from looking through that, was developed for softer markets like this to allow for development of smaller buildings or for development in softer markets that wouldn't necessarily require subsidies. So when you start to look mm -hmm. at some of the deeper levels, um, they, they, it might be that they require more subsidy to be viable. And so I think we were just allowing for the, the full spectrum of options and for the discussion to continue without necessarily saying, you know, where it needs to land at the end of the day. But we saw, we saw merits on both sides, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Capelli. Uh, yeah, just a, a comment uh, that, was, uh, that was made about the rents lagging behind uh, the rate increases in the rest of the city and in a city with a, an acute housing shortage, uh, demand usually uh, dr drives the market, but I would suggest that you consider that it's the lack of transportation, any real transportation on Staten Island that has really kept down the uh, the rental uh, market, uh, not uh, uh, the other factors that were cited. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Uh, 
Well, in the course of all of these remarks now, my list of questions is, or comments, <laughs> things I want to comment on um, has grown, but I was starting after Commissioner Deleuze spoke to um, really want to reinforce um, her comments about affordability here. Um, I think that the, um, certainly the testimony we heard um, and the information provided by HPD really reinforces the need for um, affordability at the uh, lowest income levels here. Because um, if we don't do that, what we do know is that the market is going to continue to produce what's already there. And that's, I think we, we heard powerful testimony that there is a population that is not being housed here and that is quite vulnerable. So I would um, subscribe to Commissioner Deleuze's um, request that we concentrate this um, on the options that serve the deepest affordability. Um, on the discussion about um, physical cultural establishments, isn't there a definition, there is a defined term, adult physical culture establishments, and those, aren't those the facilities that we are concerned about excluding? Because I think zoning excludes those already. It says they're not allowed in any district. Yes. So isn't the problem already solved by zoning? I mean, the, the problem I, I, perceived by those who are worried about allowing physical I, culture. I think Yes, except to the extent that there might be illegal or illicit activities happening and the right. ones that don't self-identify as adult physical and cultural. Okay, but can't we rely on enforcement to take care of that? that that's essentially we, what our argument the, is. We it have would, the tools in the It would the be zone. odd for zoning to exclude illegal or illicit activities from, you know, from, right. from the process. Right. Um, and then since we got around to the discussion of the need for municipal facilities, fire stations and police departments, I once again go back to my prior life here, which was leading the Community Board 4's discussion um, of the Hudson Yards rezoning. And one of our um, many long memos on this topic was about missing infrastructure. And we highlighted the need for um, police stations and fire stations, which was identified in the EIS as something that was going to be needed once the population forecast for Hudson Yards arrived. And we made the point that now was the time to secure that space because once the developers got in there, the space was going to become impossibly unaffordable for the city to acquire sites. We offered up a number of sites to the um, NYPD and the fire department. They said, oh, we're not ready to take that space yet. We don't need it. And lo and behold, now the fire department has recognized that they can't serve the new Hudson Yards neighborhood and are looking for a site. Just saying. Now's the time to cite those spaces. Like Commissioner Bernie. You know, just on that topic, in a previous life, it did a lot of work with FDNY and new fire eyes and so on. And certainly at that time, uh, the issue was the reverse, that the siting of firehouses had been done at a time when there were many uh, wood frame buildings, there was no sprinkler systems. Right. And over time, the frequencies of fires has gone down and down. Right. And they were struggling with the desire to close firehouses right. and getting a lot of community opposition, but they were arguing that a lot of these firefighters were not really doing much because of the lack of incidents of fires. I can't speak to exactly the coverage in, in uh, this area, and that would be a good conversation to have, but I suspect if they've got four companies there, they're probably pretty well covered. Right. And they, they've echoed that, that sentiment. Other comments? Well, I want to thank you, Joe, in particular for the way you methodically worked your way through these various issues, leaving us today with the, the nits and nets. Um, not that the issues aren't important, but just a, an odd combination of issues. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to post-hearing follow-up on the JFK North site. Uh, there was a letter in your package. I want to note that we are continuing to work with EDC on further follow-up, if there are any other questions that we can take back. Okay, we'll, we'll be back at the next review session to discuss this in depth. Um, on MANA products, uh, Alexis is here to discuss some proposed technical modifications. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm before you 
here today um, just with one slight modification to the zoning text as it had been previously shown. So MANA Products is of course located in the Long Island City portion of Community District 2 in Queens. Um, and this is the expansion to the qualifying text around the expansion of existing manufacturing buildings. Um, and the portion of the text that we're going to be modifying is just the exclusion of those three words that are ringed in red here. Um, and it, they were innocuous words that were added and then we, uh, when we were restructuring the text to ensure that the highlighted yellow portion was only going to be applicable to this particular project area, um, we had forgotten to eliminate that text. It is very innocuous text, but again, if we leave it there, it would have citywide implications and this was only locally referred. Any questions? Thank you to our eagle-eyed zoning division for picking this up. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, uh, the Manhattanville Factory District Walkway. I'll just note that I had the opportunity to go up and walk the site there, and I know that we heard testimony about how desolate it was, and it's interesting being so close to 125th Street, within sight of the Columbia Manhattanville campus, but because of the arrangement of the streets, um, it certainly can do with more lively street presence. And then uh, Calvin Brown is here to discuss the East Harlem neighborhood rezoning follow-up actions. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, during the post-hearing follow-up, there was um, one property owner who came to testify um, because he was concerned about the text, um, specifically the uh, transit relocation um, encumbering his site. So just wanted to kind of walk the commission through, you know, this um, text amendment. It was something that we didn't include in the original um, rezoning. We didn't think about it, but after discussions with the community and the way that we were treating other parts of the area, it came up. So just to remind you guys, along Lexington Avenue, we treated that area very much different from this area. We rezoned it from the R72 to the R7D with a commercial overlay, but because this intersection was wide um, and we felt like it can take density, we upzoned it to the R9. Um, and because we decided to do that and we made the case for it, the community felt like they wanted to make sure that there was better pedestrian circulation at the intersection. Um, just to kind of zoom into the site, the site is 100 feet along um, Lexington Avenue and 80 feet along um, East 116th Street. And there's other uh, commercial tenants in addition to the pharmacy. Um, and you can see that this is a wide street. Um, I followed up with the MTA just to you know, find out the obvious question that there's no assistance for, you know, property owners who feel like they're encumbered for development. But they said that they, the first steps is to sit down with the property owner just to see um, how the site can accommodate the uh, stairway um, entrance and to just kind of work with them from there. They're willing to work with the, the property owner moving forward. So I did connect MTA with uh, the property owner. So uh, we'll follow up, you know, once they've connected. Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. I, I think that the property owner's concern was the uh, cost. The, do we have any idea from the MTA if there's a way of mitigating the cost? Well, th they w don't subsidize that. So they were saying that they are willing to, they have to first evaluate the site to see how extensive it would need to be um, before they can um, give any sort of cost estimates. I'd also note this was an instance where, with the benefit of hindsight, it would have been better to bring forward the need to move the subway stations within the building line as part of the original proposal. But this is an instance the property owner received a very market upzoning to yeah. the highest density that we allowed within the district. And I think it is a just plain good planning to anticipate um, when the Second Avenue subway comes, having the entry within the building. And we did treat this R9 differently from the other R9s. Um, it has a maximum height of 205 feet where the other R9s that were mapped in the district are at 175. So, so in essence, the, the, the large upzoning mitigates the cost of... <laughs> we don't look at it in, in those terms. But from um, his perspective, because... From he, his perspective... He was the, making a cost... Uh, a very mass, a very right. significant, the highest upzoning that we undertook in the entire area. Thank you. 
Commissioner Levin. Yeah, I also think we need to we need to credit the um, property owner who you know, you know seemed relatively unsophisticated about the complexities of zoning, yet nonetheless <laughs> did a very good job Amazing. of explaining their plight. Um, I wonder also, if in addition to connecting them with the MTA, it's possible also to point to other developments similarly situated that have had to include um, a subway entrance on okay, site to sense. illustrate how development might actually work. Because my, my guess is they're not super connected to the development world, um, tried to find some resources, but might also use some advice about how this isn't the end of the world for them. Um, yes, that makes and sense. And how the, you know, this easement requirement might be accommodated without killing future development. Because, you know, he did sort of say, look, the, 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 the worst thing would be I'm going to have to uh, sell the site to a credit tenant, um, which I don't think any one of us would really want to see. No. The other thing that I would also note is the time frame. <laughs> right. Right. And th that could be helpful in talking to, uh, connecting him to others who have developed that way along the existing portion of the Second Avenue subway. Right. Commissioner Ortiz. I, I mean, I, I was really impressed by um, his comments and was certainly sensitive to them. Um, you know, his concern seems, his concern seemed very reasonable. and. And, you know, I, I do understand that this section was upzoned, but we must have many examples. Uh, and I, I hear where we're going with this. I'm not <laughs> suggesting otherwise. But I, there are examples of, uh, you know, subway entrances on busy corners with similar densities that I think are working fine. So I think, you know, there there's something to be said for the additional costs associated. I mean, it's it's... Um, an unfunded mandate um, in some ways, and we don't even know what those costs are. Um, and, and there seems to be some consideration that could potentially be made for an alternative um, if, in fact, you know, this site, you know, if it's unnecessary. Um, and, and not to speak for the MTA, th that's a consideration. That's why they want to first speak with the property owner, because they have to evaluate infrastructure. It, it, it may not be suitable for that. I, I don't know. They said that in this process, the first step is to kind of just speak with the property owner, evaluate the site, and then move forward from there. So are you saying there's potentially a resolution in which the MTA would say, we don't need it in your building? Or, I, or I, we can't do it? I the do, they wouldn't say that when I was pressing and asking questions. They just said that their first step is to sit with the property owner. I'll note that just earlier today, we looked at a site in which the MTA determined that the easement wasn't wasn't needed. But I would imagine that determination needs to come sooner rather than later so that they can make decisions on, on the property, on the development of the property. Again, the time frame is, un is unknown. We don't know when the Second Avenue subway is coming, when they would choose to develop. I, I do have to say that the notion of, as a planning principle, looking to move entries within buildings strikes me as something that we would want to do as part of upzonings, um, that we've done it in our highest density Manhattan zonings, viewing it as a positive, and certainly that would be our vision for this neighborhood, that it has the same quality. So just want to note that this is actually on the Lexington Avenue um, line. The subway oh, right, opening right, yes. is, is right, right there. Right. You can see it. And, and, and I think that that gets to the point, is that they have an existing infrastructure here exactly. that they need to evaluate yes. how they would accommodate this below the ground. So this is not a new entrance. No, you can, you can, no. you can see I, it there. No, I understand. Photo. You're yeah. clarifying that. Yeah, yeah. And what I would gladly undertake, um, since we work very, very closely with the MTA real estate, is to call Jano Lieber, who heads it, and um, encourage the MTA to accelerate their outreach with this particular property owner. And thank you, Commissioner Levin. The, the comment about connecting him with others who have done this before, I think, could be incredibly practical. Yeah. Other comments? Thank you, Calvin. You're welcome. 
Okay, moving on to uh, to Howard Avenue. Okay. And Brook 156. Oh, okay. Believe that that would conclude uh, the review session for Monday, April 8th, 2019. And the time is 3.46 p.m. Thank you.